save right now. The anticipation is killing me. I got some beautiful YouTube ads. I don't like your reference to MoCo there. I think we got to change that. Why you don't like it? Uh, that's not MoCo. That's a, that's some other county down there. I don't know. There's only one MoCo. I don't want to hear it. Oh, you're talking about that one. Okay. On it, yeah. Well, you know where I live. Come at me. I don't care. I sent someone at you. You're, you'll be assassinated. Don't worry. Well, yeah. Uh, I've been hearing that for years, dude. Somehow I managed to escape every time. Oh, oh here we are. Look at that picture, huh? What a beautiful shot that is. Um, it's a beautiful shot of one of America's largest cities. I think Philadelphia is number six. In America, as far as population, it's no longer top five, thanks to Phoenix. Yeah, boo, Phoenix. fucking Phoenix. Yeah, but uh, it's still top five ten. And, and um, <laughs> Philadelphia, for those of you who might be latecomers to all of this, is going to be the site of a large road meet in August, uh, hosted by yours truly. And I thought one of the things that I could do in the lead up to that meet coming up on August 20th and 21st is to do a uh, webinar series similar to what we've done in the past, um, you know, where we break down cities and their road and bridge networks and we discuss the history and all that other stuff. I felt like that would be a good thing to do uh, for Philly just to kind of get everybody either acclimated to the Metro for the first time, or if people are attending this meet and they could use a little quick refresher course, you know, we could also uh, put that in as well. So tonight's presentation will be part one of two. It will cover exclusively Philadelphia County and the Pennsylvania suburbs of the Delaware Valley Metro region. Uh, part two, which we'll talk about at the end of this show, that will cover the New Jersey side of the Delaware River. Okay, uh, so you will not see any discussion about New Jersey in this episode. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure why our, one of our panelists, Steve, is on the call tonight, but he is. We'll hear about New Jersey. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got on the call from Skype. We've got Steve from AlpsRoads.net. Nice to see you again. Nice to have you. Uh. And we've got. Um, Jeff Taylor from the New Jersey suburbs. Uh, he's a Philadelphia area resident, and uh, he's well versed in Philly metro uh, roads and stuff like that. So, Jeff, nice to have you. Big boo. <laughs> and Ian, young man. Uh, welcome, I don't welcome, have a. <laughs> welcome back to the show. Joining us from Southern California. Hello. Well, you One are. Eden. Yeah, you're a Southern California resident by way of Philly Metro also. Yes. Yeah. Don't Delco through and through. There you go. Um, Laura from Maryland will be joining us shortly. Also here at Wiz World headquarters in New York State, I have Erica. She has joined us for some of our episodes in the past. Hello, Erica. Hey. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so that's our panel for tonight. Um, I am going to tell this person who is texting me to shut up because I don't want to keep getting distracted. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's Bill, Steve. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so again, what better way to get us ready for a road meet than to do a webinar series? And that's what we're going to do here. Uh, again, tonight we're just going to deal with the Pennsylvania side of things. 
because uh, this will be a two-part series. So tonight is the first part, Center City, uh, Philadelphia City and County, and also the western and northern suburbs. Um, we don't have anybody from Gribble Nation here tonight. I don't know. We don't. So screw Gribble Nation. Um, I would like to tell you that I have a batch of new uploads coming out in the next month to cover some stuff from Arkansas and Tennessee from the last calendar year. And um, so that'll be coming out through the middle of June, right around the time that the Lynchburg meet is going to happen. Um, as far as Philadelphia meet weekend planning is concerned, pretty much everything has been finalized. The lunch locations for both days, August 20th and 21st, have been finalized. Um, the pre-meet events have been decided for both days. The post-meet events for both days have been decided. So really it just is a matter of me typing up the itineraries for both days at this point. Um, and don't forget my offer to uh, come out Friday night for a day zero pool party. That's yeah. right. The, pool party, yeah, no Jeff, in the pool. Right. Jeff has generously offered to host a pool party at his residence in um, the suburbs of Philly. So all of this stuff that I've just uh rattled off for you guys there are links in the description of this video um where you can find the thread on the aa roads forum that's devoted to this road meet you can also find links to the um the uh what the hell, hey. what the hell was that um you can find links to the facebook event pages for both day one and day two uh, and there might be other links in there as well that I'm forgetting about. But anyway, the, 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 most, um, the most important stuff related to the meet and the links that you can find all that stuff on, that's all. Check out the description of the video because uh, I don't think I'll be reposting anything in here. So just check the video description. I know most of the people who subscribe to my channel don't even look at the description anyway. But uh, this is going to be one of those times where you'll want to check that out if you haven't already done so. Okay. I know exactly where that old turn sign is. I bet you yep. do, young man. I, I used to pass it every day going to work when I worked at PennDOT. Mm. I'm sure you lobbied PennDOT to keep it up. Oh, yeah. Every day I'd be like, yo, please don't take this down. Please. No, give it to me. <laughs> yeah. Especially don't give it to Steve. I'm angry. <laughs> Steve would just mount it on a pole in his backyard. But yeah. There's yeah. there's two other button copy signs approaching that intersection as well. Right, yeah. I, I do have pictures of those also. Yeah. I, that's cool one because it's white button copy. Yeah, that that's rare. Yeah. 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 That um, would be one of Steve's driveway there. Yeah. Philadelphia, with a population of 1.6 million, is the sixth largest city in America. The metro population, if you take into account the Pennsylvania and New Jersey suburbs, gives you a population of over 6 million. Um, again, good for top 10 in the U.S. Um, it's one of the larger cities that we've ever tried to host a road meet in. I, I mean, obviously, Steve did a city in New York, a meet in New York City, um, so it's hard to beat that, but. Um, Philly is surprisingly untouched in the road meet, um, history. So we're going to try to break that trend in August. It is one of America's oldest major cities. It was first settled in, uh, I'm looking for the date here. I think as early as 1623, there were settlements at roughly the mouth of the Schuylkill river on the Delaware. Um, and then the modern day settlement that became known as Philadelphia was settled in 1682 under a charter uh, from William Penn. Um, so again, it's, it's a very old city. It's, it was the nation's first capital city, or first national capital, Philadelphia, before it was moved south. Um, before George Washington put his troops on I-95 and sent them down to D.C. to build the capital there. Um, 
In the years and the centuries since, uh, Philly has grown to become a major economic center, not just for Pennsylvania, but also for the Mid-Atlantic region, the Mid-Atlantic coastal region. Um, it is, of course, a cultural melding pot because of its center in uh, the immigration movement from uh, all corners of Europe in the 19th century. Um, and also known as a pretty sophisticated educational center in the nation. Um, the big five colleges, and <coughs> correct me if I screw any of these up, but I believe the big five in Philadelphia are Temple, St. Joseph's, Drexel, uh, Villanova, and Penn. You Penn, yeah. Those I believe the, you're right. Those are the five, right? Yeah, yep, very, yep, I believe so. yeah. Then Penn is Ivy League, right? And then the other four aren't, but they are very prestigious nationwide. So, and they're all, and the campuses of all five are relatively within a short distance of each other. I think Drexel and Penn are right across the street from each other um, on the west side there. Um, so, yeah, it is, a, it is a major center for higher education in Pennsylvania and uh, the eastern U.S. We'll talk about more about Billy Penn and the so-called gentleman's agreement that helped shape the city's skyline in a little bit. Um, but Jeff, I know you really want to talk about uh, some Philly pro sports. You know, Mr. Philly sports fan that you are. Um, what well, we you... got at least the Sixers have done well this year. They bowed out in the second round. We, we won't talk much about the Flyers. The Phillies are <laughs> being the Phillies this year. And we're hoping for good things from the Eagles after this uh, year's draft in uh, Barry's trades. No, we're not. Go Eagles. Go Birds. Well, Go Birds. The Eagles stole the number one wide receiver from the Titans, so I don't, I'm not sure how to feel about that. But I was mentioning to Jeff off the air that I was going to offer him my A.J. Brown jersey. I don't know where my Eagles hat for this, actually, now that I... There you go. Yeah, I got my Phillies uh, t-shirt on, my Phillies beer, but no one can see that, so. <laughs> yeah, so the Phillies are the National League East representative in baseball. There were two baseball teams in Philadelphia. The other one was the Philadelphia Athletics. Mm -hmm. uh, they were in the American League. They left for Kansas City in the 1950s and then on to Oakland after that, where they reside today, at least for now, before they move again at some point. Um, the Eagles are the NFL franchise there. The Flyers are an absolute dumpster fire, so we won't spend any time talking about them. They are the NHL representative. Philadelphia Union are interesting. They are the MLS team for the Delaware Valley. They actually play their home games down in Chester. And uh, we mentioned the Sixers briefly as the NBA team. They began life as the Syracuse Nationals before they moved to Philadelphia and took on the name 76ers, which is, of course, a nod to the year 1776, which was very significant in Philadelphia and American history. Yeah, the soccer picks up in popularity. The union's been picking up uh, some uh, fans as well there, and that's a great view of the, uh, the, the stadium down there from the Comedy Barry Bridge just before you cross over into Jersey. Yeah, I would imagine if you sit in the stands at a union match, you would get a nice view of the bridge. Yep, yep, absolutely. I think Philly might be the best city in America for mascots. What do you think? Pretty... Yeah, we kind of stole that from the uh, San Diego chicken there um, when we got the uh, Philly fanatic. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's one mascot in particular that rises above the rest of the country here. Are you speaking about Gritty? Uh, it's the only one to speak of. Well, he's the only decent I've, I've thing that's Flyers-related that's worth mentioning. So, there he is. Uh, right. He hasn't had much to be happy about lately, but Gritty is... Uh, look at that ugly motherfucker. Oh my Gritty God. is Philadelphia. Absolutely. Yeah, he's I ugly as hell. You know, I don't know. When Gritty first came out, a lot of people didn't God, like him. He, he was Gritty scary. <laughs> Um, yeah. A lot of people thought it was scary and everything like that. And then uh, Pittsburgh, I think the um, the uh, Penguins uh, criticized them or something. And suddenly uh, the Philly fans got all defensive, said, no, Gritty's ours. We love him. And yeah. he took off after that. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, so Philly's got some very interesting on the field or on the ice mascots. Their stadiums are very interesting as well. Lincoln Financial Field is located well they're well all the stadiums really are located in South Philly in the Philadelphia Sports Complex, which is served by I ninety five. Um I think Patterson Avenue serves as a main uh, thoroughfare through there as well. Um, Lincoln Financial is where the Eagles play their home games. Citizens Bank Park, which is where we will be doing the day one post-meet baseball game at. Um, That's where the Phillies play. Uh, You can see that in the lower right. Ooh, I get to talk about something completely off-topic now. Hey. So, we don't talk very much about ocean liners and ships and whatnot. So this might this part might seem like a bit of a non sequitur for you guys. Um, but when you arrive, if you're coming to day one of, and you're coming to lunch on Saturday the 20th, you might notice this large ship that is docked right across the street from the restaurant that we're going to be going to. And you might wonder to yourself, what on earth is this? And you probably, if you don't know anything about this ship, you will not be aware of the fact that you're looking at one of the great maritime achievements in America in the 20th century. The SS United States was commissioned in 1952 as a transatlantic ocean liner running the New York to England route. Um, in 1952, on her maiden voyage, she shattered the transatlantic speed record, setting records, by the way, that still stand to this day and are unlikely to ever be surpassed. The ship served the United States until 1969. She was withdrawn from service, and she has not served a paying customer since. Consider the fact that when she was withdrawn in, 19, in November of 1969, the Beatles were still officially a band. And she has not sailed commercially since. Uh, there have been many there have been many attempts to try to bring the ship back into service, especially in the last twenty years since her return to American soil. She's actually been docked at the same pier in South Philadelphia since 1996. Uh, today, she is under the ownership of the SS United States Conservancy, um, which is chaired by Susan Gibbs, who I believe is the granddaughter of the ship's chief designer, William Gibbs. Um, and there is well we'll get to that in a second but the ship some more information about the ship it's 990 feet long its beam is 103 feet wide so she was built to Panamax capacity for the time anyway in 1952 she was also designed with engines that were initially used by the navy for aircraft carriers so she was by far the fastest civilian ship of her size ever built. Um, she was, r- rumor has it, she was capable of being converted into a massive military transport ship within the matter of two days. Um, her unofficial troop capacity was somewhere around 14,000 men. Now, we never got to see this ship in war livery, fortunately. She was placed on standby during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, but that was that she was never actually called up for active duty. Um, so we never got to see the ship in war service, But so some of those numbers are a bit hypothetical. But um, what does stand in spite of that is the fact that this was an amazing maritime and engineering achievement that certainly deserves your attention and certainly deserves your support. And in fact... I've listed on the next slide here the website for the SS United States Conservancy. You can visit that website uh, if you're interested in learning more about the ship, um, whether it's, it's, it's history, it's more recent trials and tribulations, the quest to restore the ship to some sort of service, probably as a permanently moored attraction somewhere on the East Coast. Um, or if you'd like to support the efforts more directly, you can certainly do so. You can do all of that by visiting the website that I have on the page here. There's also a really great book that I have in the picture here. I'm actually looking at a copy of it right now. Um, this book was produced by, it was written by maritime author John Maxstone Graham, who is no longer with us, but when he was, he was one of the foremost leading experts on ocean liner history, uh, design, 
and all sorts of technical matters as well. And the United States was one of his favorite ocean liners. Um, and so he wrote a book about it. And the book is really interesting because it goes into a lot of not just the history of the ship itself, but also the history of its chief designer, William Gibbs, and also the transformation of the American merchant marine um, fleet over the course of the 20th century. Yeah, that's a nice picture, right? It's pretty, yeah. yeah right. So uh, this is a book that I definitely recommend you check out if you're more interested in the ship and uh, learning about you know, some of its history and getting to know that big, massive hulk that's going to be right across the street from you in South Philly on August 20th. All right. Um, so, yes, let's get back into the mix here with uh, Philly stuff. So, Billy Penn, as I like to call him, when they built City Hall in Philadelphia, they put a statue of him on the very top of, of City Hall, which you see here. This is picture on the left is looking down Broad Street uh, towards basically the center of the city grid, which is City Hall. Um, and there was some sort of gentleman's agreement that was drafted that Philadelphia would not be allowed to build any skyscrapers taller than the top of Billy Penn's you know, hat or the top of the statue. And that, that gentleman's agreement actually held up for over 100 years. Um, it was not until 1986 that the first building, the first skyscraper in Philadelphia was built that exceeded the height of City Hall. Um, Sounds like Jeff, a you could, Jeff, you could talk more about this, I think, right? First Liberty Place, one Liberty Place, like you're talking about, right? Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, I believe that Rendell was in office at the time. He was mayor, and he was really pushing the city along, and he agreed that, you know, Billy Penn, he rose, what, I believe it's 500-some feet above, uh, above um, ground level there. And they said, basically, to sum it up, let's go higher. Let, let's uh, build it up. And one Liberty Place came along. Two Liberty Place was after that. And I think we had five or so that stood above Billy Penn's uh, hat until, uh, until um, the Comcast centers were built. And Billy Penn, he was all pissed off about it. So he turned away from the uh, stadium complex. And that's why we didn't have any uh, champions in the uh, sports complex down there for many years. Yeah, I, I remember hearing about the curse of Billy Penn. Yeah. Um, but I actually heard that when they built the Comcast Center, which are the two largest buildings we're looking at in this, in this picture here, that they actually made like little miniature statuettes of Billy Penn that were replicas of the City Hall statue. And they put those on the tops of those buildings. Just to kind of say, that, like, hey, Billy Penn is still the tallest, you know, figure in Philadelphia. Now, now here's a site. If you're coming down the school there, especially in the uh, evening, you see that tall little uh, tower sticking out of the, uh, the Comcast building there. A lot of people imagine that as, uh, as the uh, middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's all lit up and everything, it certainly looks like that as you come down the highway there towards the uh, city. Oh, yeah, yeah. It does, if you look at it a certain way, yeah. Because that, that stem is lit up at night, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's, that sounds like a very Philadelphia thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so the, the the modern skyline of Philly is relatively new, like within the last 35 years or so. Um, and in fact, when you look at old pictures of Philly from the 70s or early 80s, you know, Philly was a city of roughly 2 million people, but it had such a modest skyline for a city that large. It was really remarkable. Um, it's only been in the last 25 years or so that the skyline has really boomed. And you, you, you see most of the modern steel and glass high-rises in this picture take shape in those years. Right, yeah, it was a fairly gritty city, you know, definitely second, second tier to New York City, so they tried improving that skyline there. And over the past number of years, I'll say decade or so, when you look to the right of this picture, you see that's the uh, University of Penn area, and, uh, and, and 30th Street Station is right there, and they've been building that skyline up. And yeah. that's almost like a second city, like a second downtown to a, to a center city right now. Yeah. I think they've, I think I've read them calling it 
West Center City. Like, they want to build a whole new development out there to serve, like, centered around Penn and Drexel out that way. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're building up and they're building outwards with the skyline, which is really... Well, I mean, as an engineer, I'd really like to see that. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Here's some more skyline photos. You know, I really like the Philly skyline. Um, when I was a kid, so this was like early 90s, so this was before a lot of these buildings were built, but I really liked the appearance of Liberty Plaza as a kid. And so it became one of my favorite, you know, skyscrapers as, a, as an impressionable little kid. But... Um, over the years, as I've matured and as I've gotten into engineering more, I, I've really come to appreciate the Philly skyline as a whole. And I, I think it's really, um, it's a great, it's a handsome looking skyline, you know, from any, any of the angles that we're looking at in this picture and on these slides. I know that on the lower left of this slide, this is looking from the Camden waterfront, uh, but the rest of these are from uh, the Pennsylvania side. This is above the Schuylkill um, on a beautiful spring day. Um, oh, yeah. Overall, the downtown um, area of Philly is fairly compact to go from one end to the other. It's only about a mile walking or so. A lot of people advise when you come into the city, park the car, you don't have to drive anywhere. You can basically walk everywhere. So that, that skyline is compact, but yet, and, and, and I will say there's no great features of the skyline. Like, like, I think Dallas has a really nice uh, building or two. Other cities have great buildings. This one can be kind of ordinary and plain, but it, it, it does add some nice features to the city. I agree. Yeah, it, it's one of my favorite skylines of any of the cities I've been to. That's for sure. <clears throat> yeah, so this is a view looking into Center City from the south above the Schuylkill River. Yeah, so one other thing I'd like to mention is um, one of our pre-meet events is going to feature the Schuylkill Banks Trail, which is a riverfront walkway um, built on the east bank of the Schuylkill River, so the center city side of it. Um, it's a nice walking, biking, pedestrian facility, and it gives you some great views of the bridges of center city um, from South Street all the way up to the art museum. Um, you, get, you get some great views of the skyline from here as well. You get some great views of the Schuylkill Expressway. Um, there's a lot to see on this trail, and there's, there's a lot to discuss. So, um, you know, that's that's a location that I really wanted to do a, a pre-meet walkthrough event at. So I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun to uh, partake in. This is a recent development, I, I, within the last 10 years, certainly. I don't remember exactly when it was built. And they're still expanding it, as we'll see later when we talk about bridges. But um, the, the, the trail itself is relatively new. And as I said, it's a really nice, nicely built trail. It gets a lot of use, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Bikers and walkers love it. Yeah, yeah, they sure do. Uh, let's see here. Roads, maps. Well, let's see here. So, um, we're going to go through some maps here. It's important to note that when I-76 was designated on the interstate highway system, it was originally numbered I-80S. So that's why you're seeing 80S shields. And then, of course, instead of I-676, you had I-680. Originally, when they numbered these highways, 76 and 676 were flipped. So you had I-76 running through Center City directly, and 676 was meant to follow the Schuylkill down and then over to the Walt Whitman Bridge. Um, those numbers were eventually switched around. Uh, if we go to, well, this still shows it, but... Uh, the, this is the first I've ever seen 280 on 276. That's an interesting one. Yeah, so everything was an X80 back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, I'm so, a little yeah. surprised because in, in Turnpike history, like New Jersey Turnpike was not that big on signing itself as an interstate. I'm surprised that Pennsylvania Turnpike went the other route and wanted to. They just didn't leave it blank the whole time. Yeah, I mean, the Northeast Extension was the, the holdout there. All right, right. But, uh, yeah, no, they, they wanted the mainline East-West Turnpike signed. 
from day one. So yeah, um, this map also shows the um, the seventy six six seventy six switch. Uh, the map on the right that is. Um, I think that map is from the late sixties. I want to say. Because again, notice how a lot of I-95 from said is center city on south is still a dotted line at this point. Years. Yeah, so by this I time... I through Philly was the last portion of it to be built, unless you want to consider the whole uh, New Jersey issue there. Yeah, well, we'll talk about both of those sure, coming up here in a, in a little bit. Um, okay. So by the time we get to this map, the interstates have been flipped, so you can kind of see where 76 now follows the more southerly route, and 676 is intended to go through Center City. Um, also, you see out to the west how 476 is a mostly a giant dotted line still. Um, that was not to change all that much until the 1980s or 90s when at last it was put together and we'll we'll go through the history of that highway as well but this is more or less the highway system that exists today um, the Vine Street Expressway and the Blue Route were the two longest holdouts they were not completed until the early 90s after 40 plus years of planning and lawsuits and environmental review and all that good stuff yeah that's another view of the current system if we zoom in a little bit on center city here you see how kind of 76 takes on more of a north to south orientation around the west side of center city 95 is the north south highway on the east side of center city and then the Vine Street Express YI 676 connects the two of them east to west. That is the extent of the central Philadelphia freeway system. As we'll talk about and as we'll discuss, it was meant to be a whole lot bigger than that. Steve, you were uh, mentioning the PA Turnpike and interstate designations. Um, what would you like to say about the PA Turnpike yourself? It's not in Philadelphia, so we don't have to talk about it. Well, see. <clears throat> that's the... <laughs> see, now, we are talking about Metro Philadelphia, of course. It's um, it's arguably Metro at this point, but, I you know, I, I could talk more about current than I can about the history, so I'll start, I'll let you start it off. Uh, well, so the original PA Pike was opened in 1940 between, I think it went as far as Carlisle and Pittsburgh. Um, that was the extent of it. And then in the years after World War II, it was extended east to Valley Forge. And then in the late 50s, it was extended to the Delaware River. Uh, the section from Valley Forge westward became I-76. The section east of Valley Forge was designated as I-276. Um, because it is a major east-west highway across the northern suburbs of Philly, it is a very significant commuter facility as well as a long-distance highway. Of course, when they, when they built the turnpike originally in the 50s, they thought it was just going to purely serve long-distance traffic. But they didn't, of course, account for the fact that suburban sprawl is a thing. And it reached all the way up to the turnpike and its and its immediate vicinity. Vicinity. So, um, it's a major suburban highway for local traffic as well as a major uh, linchpin in the eastern turnpike system that stretches from the Atlantic coast all the way out to Chicago. Um, yeah, and as Steve was alluding to, yeah, there was a significant major development in the Bristol area, which is where I-95 comes into all of this that I'm sure Steve would like to talk about. Right, because so, that's, that's a fairly recent development in the system, and as you say on the slide, it provides the missing link. A few years ago, we had a couple of outings. I don't. I think there was a meet, but I know we definitely had less formal outings as well to go check out the construction of this multi-decade link and the history of this really goes back to new jersey which uh thank you for bringing my state up but part of the reason that this link even exists is because the somerset freeway never came to fruition or from trenton on north 
uh, basically from what's now 295 around Trenton to what's now 287 around uh, Somerset, Middlesex counties, that I-95 was supposed to go diagonally across New Jersey. And once that was not going to happen, there was a disconnect in the 95 system. It went up to Trenton, disappeared at the interchange where it was supposed to get off. They later extended it to Route 1, but basically 95 disappeared and then magically reappeared on the New Jersey Turnpike. And the solution to that was if we can't connect it in New Jersey, we'll connect it in PA, get I-95 where it crosses the Pennsylvania Turnpike, we'll find a way on because that was one thing Pennsylvania has been known for in its decades of freeway history is the turnpike would never interchange with freeways. You always have to get off on the original interchange, cross over a surface street, you'll get uh, how to get from the Northeast extension to I-80, for example. So it was missing that connection. And only recently did they finally get around to constructing it, opening it, where now you can get off 95 right onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And now, thanks to that connection, you have a continuous I-95. So New Jersey's loss was uh, Pennsylvania's decades of torture. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, it's it's really interesting when you go back and you look at all the different iterations for a direct connection between the two, because they have been talking about that for a long time prior. And something finally had to give, and they were able to fit this project in. Now, the extent of the project that Steve's talking about is just the two ramps that you see on the screen right now. They're basically there to serve the 95 through traffic movements in the north and south directions. Now, when they drew up the plans for the direct connection interchange, there are six other ramps that were planned as part of the interchange itself. However, uh, those ramps were not part of the initial phase of construction. Um, those are contingent on funding uh, and as far as I'm aware, no funding sources have been identified to construct any of the remaining six ramps in Bristol. It remains planned. I, I wouldn't say it's never going to happen. I would just say for the time being, it's planned. Yeah, the ramps, the, and when they built the two 95 ramps, the, the, the other six ramps are accounted for in the geometric layout of the 95 ramps so they can be still fit in you know whenever oh, yeah. funding comes up out but um yeah the, if you're holding out hope hoping for these other ramps to be built i would say it's more of a long-term thing than a short-term thing well by long term i wouldn't i would say within our lifetimes we we can expect <laughs> them to start they they are <laughs> trying to get to that next phase it's not dead in the water by any stretch yes we can expect them to start in our lifetime Yes, but the, as we know, things progress at the speed of PennDOT in Pennsylvania, so. Well, this one's Pennsylvania Turnpike, so you never know. Oh, so it may go a little faster. I mean, it, might go, it might go slower if it's PTC. I don't know. Um, hey, speaking of PTC, let's stay on the Turnpike system for a little while here and talk about the Northeast Extension, which was not part of the interstate system when it was built, it actually only became part of the interstate system in this century, I think. Or late, very late last century. It was around the turn of the century, I think. Um, it was just before. I Ian, you answer. Wasn't it like the late 90s that it became 476? That's what I thought. Uh, it might have been late 90s, yeah. But yeah, it was known as Pennsylvania Route 9. Uh, that's the that's the state highway designation it was given, and it was known as Route Nine for the first forty, almost fifty years of its existence, um, and then it was finally added to the interstate system as a long extension of I four seventy six, making four seventy six the longest auxiliary interstate in America at about one hundred and thirty miles long. Uh, the northeast extension connects the east west main turnpike in Plymouth Meeting with. Lehigh Valley and also Scranton Wilkes Bear and also the road up to it reconnects with I eighty one and Clark Summit, which if you take eighty one north from there, you'll end up in uh, Binghamton, New York, before too long. Um, this was one of the more challenging parts of the Turnpike system to be built. They ran into some significant challenges in the Pocono Mountains. 
um, trying to find a path for the highway through the mountains itself around Scranton. Oh, yeah. And also it's home to one of the tunnels on the turnpike system, the Lehigh Tunnel, which exists between the Lehigh Valley and Mahoning Valley interchanges. Uh, the Lehigh Tunnel was built as a single bore two lane tunnel originally in the 50s as part of turnpike modernization in the late 80s early 90s a second twin bore was added that opened to traffic in the early 90s um i think that was the most recent turnpike tunnel improvement project if i'm not mistaken because uh, the mainline tunnels west of harrisburg and west of carlisle haven't really been altered since they were built i could be wrong about that but i don't i don't think yes so. Am I wrong about that? I mean, there's a lot of tunnel bypasses out there, so... Well, I'm just talking about improvements to the tunnels themselves. I know that the tunnels, some of them were bypassed, but... Um, they just still exist, it's fair. What were you going to say, Jeff? I was going to say, I believe that was the last tunnel to be, well, built to be uh, twin there. Although I would say it, it's kind of hard to say it was twin, being that they used two different... Uh, construction methods to bore each tunnel. Yeah, because by the time the 80s came around, tunneling technology had changed quite a bit from the 50s. So you really, you built the same tunnel twice, but because you were using completely different methods each time, the tunnels look very different from each other. And also you're building to very different standards too. You know, right. um, if you look at this picture on the right, for instance, that's the newer tunnel on the right. Um, and there's, it's got more of a circular shape to it. There's more ventilation units in that tunnel um, than the one on the right. Um, it's just it's just two different ways to really build the same tunnel, just one or two generations apart from each other. And I and I don't know that I've ever gone on the record of saying this, but my one of my favorite drives in all of America, even today, is to drive the Northeast Extension. Um, from uh, Plymouth meeting up to Clark Summit because it's a very scenic drive. Um, and once you get up to the northern reaches of it, up across from Scranton, there's hardly anybody on the road with you. So it's a very relaxing experience. Uh, the one thing that I would point out to you is that if you are going to do that, you might want to check what your toll bill is going to be because it's <laughs> cheap. <laughs> I know that's why Steve doesn't make that drive. My parents did it. I don't have to. Well, there you go. I think it's a gorgeous drive and worth the money. Oh, hey, I'm here. <laughs> Ladies Yay. and gentlemen. Yay. That is amazing. I agree with Laura. Laura has at last joined us. Well, I've actually been here for like 20 minutes. I just didn't have anything to say. <laughs> Yay. Oh, all right, so you've been listening to me blabber on. Okay. Yeah, okay. I jumped. I, I I logged on in about the U um the um the USS United States. All right. Yeah. Well, that's that, that's a good time to join us. Yeah. <clears throat> do you, Laura? Did you? Uh, I looked at your notes. Did you? But I don't remember anything that you wrote conveniently enough. But did, do you have anything that you would like to say about the Blue Route? I hate to I hate to like throw you into the fire like right away after you like let us know that you're existing. Tell us here. five things about the blue root right now. It's blue, and it's a root, and it's not always blue. Things. Wow, you're you're amazing. You got it. <laughs> I know a lot about Philly history, as you'll come to learn, but not every route. At least not yet, every route. So I defer to y'all to talk about the blue route. Okay. Um, well, so officially, we should get something clear here, that the official name of this highway is the Mid-County Expressway. Now, you will hear approximately zero people in Philadelphia Metro refer to it as such. Um, it is widely known in Philly Metro as the Blue Route. And there's a very straightforward reason for that um here's the map of the blue route by the way highlighted in red west of center city um back in the 50s and the 60s when they were planning this highway um 
they had to choose an alignment for it, like they do for any other major highway that's being built in a suburban area. So they came up with different routes and they color coded them, like you see on the screen right now. And for your purposes and for orientation purposes, north is to the left in this picture. So we've actually taken this picture, this map, and we've just rotated it 90 degrees so that you get this. Okay, you see, what, see what's going on there? So on the far right of the screen, on the upper right, you have the Delaware River and Chester. On the far left, you have the East-West uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike. So that's, that's what we've done. We've just rotated the screen 90, 90 degrees. So you had these main routes to pick from. So you have a green route, see, that would have... Green route was actually kind of interesting because it would have tied in directly with downtown Chester and the Commodore Berry Bridge. And then you had a blue route and you had a red route there, see? So they had these routes to pick from and ultimately you'll never guess which one they picked. <sighs> Going with blue. Erica, was the says, green one. Erica says blue. What do you guys say? Green. Green has to be green. It has to be green. <sighs> I like green too. It has, yeah. has to be green. Erica will kill me if I disagree with her, so I have to agree with her. <laughs> uh, yeah, so to nobody's shock, the blue route was selected as the preferred alternative for this highway. Um, and it lived a very long life on planning maps through the 60s, through the 70s, through the 80s even. Um <laughs> Most of it was a dotted line on a map until the late 1980s when finally the last environmental and lawsuit hurdles were overcome and the expressway was constructed in the late 80s, early 90s. The final piece of it, which was the Mid-County Interchange to directly connect uh, the Blue Route with the Pennsylvania Turnpike, was not completed until 1992. It was the last major highway to be completed in Philadelphia Metro. Um, there were, because of the amount of time that it took to build this highway and because of the amount of contentious, you know, disagreements about it, there were a number of compromises built into this highway, a reduction in the number of interchanges is one of them. Also the narrower footprint of the highway. Most suburban highways have six or eight lanes of traffic. This highway for at least half of its length has only four lanes of traffic. It has six or eight lanes of traffic. They just don't have six lanes to put them in. Well, that, <laughs> and that has become a major problem since its opening in the 90s. Uh, the, the Blue Route has become notorious as being a real traffic headache. Um, it is the only freeway serving really that whole area of Philly Metro. And it's it was intended to serve as a bypass for Center City, but it really doesn't act as one because it just serves all that suburban development and um, it just becomes another parking lot just <clears throat> just like most of the other highways in the metro. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. I have been through there at some very non-peak hours and right at the split, actually on 95 South, Either one of the two directions is always backed up, either ninety five or four seventy six. So yeah, that that junction at ninety five has always been bad. Yeah, that you always hit traffic there if you're going south on ninety five through there. Oh yeah, of traffic merging in from four seventy six, or if you're coming north on ninety five and traffic splits for four seventy six north. Yeah, yeah, you always hit traffic in Chester there. Yeah. As a native of media. PA where the blue route kind of like goes right near. I, I have learned to avoid the blue route at all costs whenever I travel like to Philly. Like I, I know like all the back roads like go around the blue route because like usually all the time like it just sucks so much. Like I, I like if I if I go into Philly like I just get on at ninety five. Like I drive south along some side streets until I get to ninety five and I'll just go on ninety five and go into the city. Like I won't even touch the blue route. It's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah, and because of the constricted right of way that they ultimately built the road in, there's really not a whole lot they can do as far as widening. Um <laughs> You know, because again, that was a major concession and compromise that was made in order to just get the highway built as it was. 
Um, so it's very unlikely that you're going to see any kind of major improvement to that highway um, anytime soon. Yeah, and anytime they try to do an improvement to a highway around here, there's just so much uh, pushback that it, it it's really a non-starter. Yeah, and Philadelphia in particular was really anti-highway, and well, and maybe you're getting that sense already. But when we talk about the unbuilt system, that that's really going to come into play even more. Um, this was another highway that was in limbo for a number of years. Um, it didn't. It was completed somewhat sooner than, you know, 476 was, but it took until 1985 for there to be a continuous I-95 across Philly Metro. Um, it largely parallels the Delaware River uh, between Chester and the north northeast Philly suburbs. Um, there were a couple of significant developments. One of them was community-based, one of them was engineering-based that really blocked completion of the highway. The major citizen compromise that was made around Penn's Landing to ensure that road's construction, one of the things that they did there was they built decks over the highway, like you see in the picture on the left. Um, those were built to accommodate green space and other, other features to lessen the impact of the highway on the surrounding community and also the Delaware River waterfront. Um, the Penn's Landing section was eventually pushed through after seven years of construction and almost 20 years of litigation. It was opened in 1979. The last section of 95 to be built in Pennsylvania was the four-mile stretch around Philadelphia International Airport. There, there were more engineering-related challenges, uh, particularly the fact that the soil from the Essington area all the way up to uh, the airport itself was very very poor very um very soft very ill-suited for construction of a road bed on um so if you're driving that section and you see that a lot of that section of highway is elevated there's a long viaduct that doesn't really go that high above the ground but one of the ways they got around some of the softer soils in that area was to just build viaducts for the main line which of course added to the cost and the time to construct the highway but um, that whole area around the highway was, that, that, that area around the uh, airport, rather, was the last piece to be completed. It was opened in late 1985. It was the last piece of I-95 to be opened until the Direct Connect interchange up in Bristol that Steve was telling us about was completed in 2018. So actually the last two pieces of a direct full-length I-95 to be completed were on opposite sides of Philadelphia Metro. Laura, you're here, right? I am here, and I have a lot to say about the Delaware Expressway. Uh, well, why don't you get started, young lady? Sure thing. So, <laughs> hi, Rainy. <laughs> oh, the three-year-old has joined us, too. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, she's also learning about the uh, controversy in Center City. Because, you know, as a good road geek mom, I'm teaching her about how, really, this the Delaware Expressway, you know, was one of the most controversial mm. of the highways to get built because of the fact that it was going to, you know, go along the, you know, east side of Center City. Um, basically, it was not just, an, it, it was not just that residents had a problem with it, but even the architects you know, it, I, I found it really notable that in 1963, upon seeing the model, architect Frank Frank Weissa confronted Edmund Bacon, the chief planner at the Philadelphia City Planning Commission, and warned him that it was going to cut off Center City from the waterfront. And yes, Edmund Bacon is actually Kevin Bacon's father. So <laughs> Philadelphia freeways are <laughs> less than six degrees from Kevin Bacon. Wow. How about that? <laughs> you do a movie about him. Somebody might. Yeah, so, you know, basically after, you know, basically Weiss and his team came up with alternate designs, and then even the vice president got involved in 1967. Uh, vice President Hubert Humphrey formed a committee to assess the design. Um, then basically, um, they... 
determined so they were gonna put one really big long six block long cover but that ended up getting denied by the federal government because of the expensive ventilation system so that's why they ended up with two smaller decks instead Okay. and um basically um you know work began in 1972 um on that section um Something else I found really interesting <laughs> at this time was that by March 1979, with the Center City section nearing completion, <laughs> residents of Society Hill managed to postpone the opening of the expressway. Basically, the, the city councilman, <laughs> Melvin J. Greenberg, led a, a procession of commuters from northeast Philadelphia into Society Hill, beeping horns and tying up traffic in the area. Boy. How inclusive of them. <laughs> Oh, but no. I mean, it didn't stop it really from opening. It just oh, sort of it, know, it we helped. Just, we, we should sing gritty after them. Oh, we are called sing. Sorry. Yeah. We, well, you know what though? The reality is, and I mean, I hate to be blunt, but <laughs> thousands of buildings, you know, got destroyed along the waterfront to build the Delaware Expressway, and the waterfront was in transition at this point, right? But, you know, the majority of these buildings along the formerly industrial waterfront, the parts that were residential, were redlined African-American and immigrant neighborhoods. So, you know, and you really, and, you know, we're not really talking so much about Chester in this webinar, but it's just so glaringly obvious how 95 just rammed through to the point where you have houses facing the highway. Yeah, I mean, without any there, like just yeah. like the, their front yard is 95 there's no yeah. sound barriers there's no nothing so if the residents of society hill if that's what it took for them to protest in order to get some sound barriers and to get you know some of the noise and pollution decrease in their neighborhood i'm all for it yeah it's uh, through center city there you have the well-established historic neighborhoods you have the <laughs> coming of the waterfront as a destination in the city because after world war ii it really wasn't seen as much of a, a destination other than for industrial use and then you also have the proximity of the highway to independence hall which is of course you know nationally significant landmark district so um to try to ram 95 through the waterfront area of, east of center city was not an easy was not going to be an easy task anyway uh, right. So perhaps we can understand why it took so long for this to even become a reality. And, and you know, to me, as I look back at it, I'm actually very surprised they were able to get it through with, with the ease, the, with the relative ease that they did. Um, you know, because this this is a project that when you study it, you know, like cities tend to do the same project in each in each of their cities. Like, there's a waterfront expressway in this city. There's a waterfront expressway through a historic district in this city. There's, a, there's an expressway through a historic district in this city. By and large, those projects don't see the light of day. So it's actually something of a miracle that 95 even exists. Um, that was one of the few that was able to get through. Uh, most were not able to get through. But, and of course, most of the expressways that were planned in Philadelphia did not get through. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, you know, they, they had to tow a fine line in order to get 95 funded and constructed and, um, they did and it works and, you know, I think, I think they did very what, well in the end. Yeah. Yeah. What's kind of amazing is this is maybe one of the best sections of 95 in the Philly area. It's four lanes wide through most of this area. It rarely can just, unless there's an issue north or south of this area. It usually flows pretty uh, freely here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is very unusual for a city of 1.6 million people, and you're and it's passing right through Center City like it does. You know. Everybody's going there, that's why. Yeah, Yeah. once you get above Line Street Expressway or below the, uh, let's say, the stadium complex, that's where it jams up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, Jeff, you mentioned Ed Rendell a little while ago. You mentioned, so he was the mayor of Philadelphia in the 80s, right? Yep. Uh, he became the governor of Pennsylvania later in his career. 
And yep. he became something of a celebrity to infrastructure enthusiasts like myself because um, a section of 95 in Northeast Philly near Girard Avenue, uh, which was on an elevated structure like this, had to be shut down on an emergency basis because the structure was near collapse. Uh, it turns out that one of the piers, one of the main support piers for this viaduct had basically been hollowed out by corrosion. Um, so they had to shut down the highway to make emergency repairs. And he went on to make a very famous appearance on the 60 Minutes program where he actually stuck his entire arm through the pier. Mm. He was able to, yeah, it was that bad. I actually don't remember that one. But yeah, okay. so anyway, that yeah. whole thing, this was around 2008, 2009, I want to say. Okay. Um, and it really reignited the debate in America on infrastructure investment and funding. And Ed Rendell became a very significant um, advocate for infrastructure and funding, a lot of which came Pennsylvania's way in the years that followed. In fact, one of the lasting legacies of that was the long-term project known as 95 Revive, which was started in 2010, um, which is intended to completely rebuild 95 uh more or less within philadelphia county uh from end to end beginning in 2010 and ending sometime in the 2030s or 2040s even um one of the major elements of that project was to replace the viaduct above gerard avenue that i mentioned before that was near collapse and this picture that we're looking at is of the new viaduct that was recently opened within the last year mm -hmm. um so this is looking south towards Center City. Uh, the new viaduct has been in service to both directions of traffic now. And once it's finally, once all the traffic is finally organized into its final configuration, it's going to be a much more comfortable drive for motorists uh, and travelers alike. But they will be working on sections of 95 you know, for forever the rest of our lives, probably. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, 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 they're, they're by no means anywhere near finished. You know, they do a few miles at a time, and I mean, they do do significant improvements to it, but just doing a few miles at a time, yeah, it's going to take quite a while to finish that. Uh, everybody's favorite Philadelphia Expressway. Mm -hmm. um, there are many curse words that I could throw out when it comes to the Schuylkill Expressway. And I know that those of you who are from Philly Metro or grew up in Philly Metro have many more that you could hurl uh, at this road's way. Um, who wants to take on the Schuylkill? Because I'm sure that all of you have something that you want to get off your chest about it. I don't think anybody wants to take on the Schuylkill. Well, <laughs> okay. I, I, yeah. A wonderful expressway to drive. What are you talking about? Yeah, on Sunday morning at six AM, it's perfect. What are you talking about? I, I've never had the, I've never had to like take it on a regular basis because that it doesn't go to the part of Philly that I live in. So like, you know, I, I've never had to deal with it. I mean, the times that I have driven it, yeah, it does suck. But you know, I, I'm sure there's other people that really could, you know, say a lot more worse things about it. I mean, look, thankfully, I don't have to commute on it every day, but it's one of those roads, if you've you got to drive it, you just assume you're going to be in uh, congestion. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> I will vouch for uh, 6 a.m. on a Sunday being an awesome time to drive it. That's about the only time you can hit 75, 80 miles an hour on it. Yeah, I, I've driven a decent speed on that road, and the key is you want to be getting off right before you get to Center City, or you only want to drive it south of Vine Street, and then either way, you're fine. Yeah, so this is a bit of an infamous highway. Um, built mainly in the 1950s, it connected the Turnpike and Valley Forge with Center City. And then later it was extended further south and east to the Delaware River at the Walt Whitman Bridge. Um, it has always been substandard. Uh, from pretty much its completion in the mid-50s, it was, it was obsolete from the day it opened, basically. I mean, a lot of the engineering of this highway was probably state-of-the-art for 1950, but it just didn't age very well. 
you know, in terms of the fact that it was just inadequate to handle the traffic that it serves. Um, and also because of the fact that this road was basically shoved in wherever there was a little bit of room to put a highway, there was no real room to widen it or do any sort of major improvements to it. So a lot of the road that you see today is very much the same road that existed in 1959. Um, not exactly the, the hallmark of great highway engineering, but in a sense that also demonstrates that the highway engineers who designed this road were working to the limits of what they had available to them. Uh, so you kind of you kind you can kind of understand what they were dealing with from that perspective. And there, there's I I kind of disagree with your last bullet there for a long time. And you look at the design of the road, the intent was to eventually add a lane coming into the city from the northwest. And supposedly the whole corridor has room for that added lane. And that's not a wild scheme. It's very plausible. But I, I'm not the best one to speak to what the reasons were why that's never happened. I'll defer to some other of you guys on that one. Said guys, but well, okay. brain. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. <laughs> no, I don't have a whole lot to say other than I've never been on it when it wasn't congested, like ever. Yeah, well, it's it's rare, you know, and, and there have been a lot of ideas over the years about adding lanes or adding roadways. Even there were some, there was a scheme that somebody came up with i think in the 70s to add an upper level to the expressway to build another level of lanes up above the existing lanes uh that didn't go anywhere there's also the matter of the maniunk expressway which we'll talk about in the unbuilt highways section of the presentation that was another crazy scheme that was drawn up in the 60s that didn't go anywhere so pretty much from the beginning, people realized that this road was just not adequate. And um, there were many attempts to do something about it, but nothing ever really stuck. So you basically, are end, you basically end up now with what equates to the Cross Bronx Expressway of Philadelphia. But when you look at it, it's one of those things. There's a lot of building going on up in that uh, area northwest of Philly. I mean, King of Prussia is really built up. They keep going up 422, so it's not inhibiting uh, uh, growth up in that area. No, it isn't. And that this is a, just another example of how the roads have not kept up with development, right? Those variable speed limit signs are also a new addition to the... Yeah. They, just added, they just added those in the last like year or two. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember when I saw those for the first time. They you're they are recent, yeah. Yeah. Have they cut down on the crashes and accidents? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. I feel like it's just like a pen dog doing the very bare minimum of like you know, oh, we, we did a thing. Let's pat ourselves on the back. Yay, we lowered the speed limit during the day. Like, woo -woo. Yeah, yeah. That... Unfortunately, that sounds like the pen dot thing to do. Well, and even that project got delayed by a few years. Which one? The, uh, the, the uh, variable speed limit program. Oh. That's what... That took a while to get off the ground. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, even despite its shortcomings, you still get some really nice views of the of the skyline. This is the view looking east towards Center City from Spring Garden Street. Um, so it it is a it, you know despite its flaws and its really serious uh shortcomings it is a pretty scenic road to drive if you hit it at the right time it, it generally follows the schuylkill river um and then it obviously makes a very scenic pass through center city um doing it at night is really nice when all the city is lit up and you can see like the skyline with all the lights and there's not not much traffic like it starts either going southbound or wet or eastbound 
uh, like into like towards Center City, you kind of like round a few corners and like the skyline just kind of like pops out at you. And like if it's at night, you see all like the lights and stuff. And it's 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 a pretty cool pretty cool little view that you get. And you got the radio and TV transmission towers. You got Boathouse Row. There's there's a lot of beautiful areas off the Schuylkill. Mm-hmm. Plus, it's also really fun when there's no traffic and you can like whip around those corners going pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I think the max speed limit on the Google is fifty. Um, no. no, it's fifty-five. In, in it, I think it's fifty-five once you get past like Route One. Right. But, like, I think like below it is it is fifty, and then it goes. I think it goes on to forty-five south of Vine Street. Yeah. On the yeah, that's right, it does. Yeah. 45. Like, you get pretty, say, like, in, in in my experience, traffic really isn't that bad until you're almost right at Center City. Uh, yeah, if it's a peak period, sure, don't go there during rush hour. But on on any given weekend, for example, you're typically in the clear for most of the drive into the city. It, it's well worth it. I feel like a lot of the times, like, coming out of the city, I feel like, is worse than going in. Because, like, if, if you, like, come out on Vine Street, it narrows down to, like, one lane as you merge onto the Schuylkill. And, like, there's kind of a bottleneck there as, like, you're merging onto Schuylkill right there that, I, like, I, I know I, I've experienced that a couple times. And, like, that it's never yeah. fun. Once you're on it, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that's not a road that I've ever had to experience as a commuter and i hope that that always continues to hold up Um, listen i got my own highways in new york i gotta deal with so you know it's not like i'm you know it's not like i'm on vacation up here in new york metro uh just go to montgomery county and you'll be fine yeah i'll keep that i'll keep that in mind all right move move to delco with all the other scumbags yeah, <laughs> yeah, it probably would rub off on me pretty quick. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have much on the job training necessary. Um, we've so we've been talking about Vine Street a lot in the last couple of minutes, and that is the east-west thoroughfare through Center City, um, which you can see here. Uh, on this map, it's the east-west thoroughfare that connects the Schuylkill with 95. Um, in short, it's a it's a quick way to get across Center City, but it this is another one of those highway projects that was held up for a long time. It was not completed in its current form until 1991. Um, it was built west of Broad Street by the 1970s. Uh, there was the piece from Broad Street east to the river that was held up for a number of years. Uh, and there were concessions made that helped save the green space within Logan Square and also further east in Franklin Square uh, and also the Chinatown neighborhood. Um, I know Laura's got notes on those. I think she's got notes on at least a couple of those. Yeah, I've got some notes. Um I want to focus on Chinatown in honor of May being Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. What's so basically? I mean, as everybody already knows, I love that. Like, this is the thing I love bringing to the Railway Wish Channel. You know, I'm a I'm a planner. I work in historic preservation. Part of why I was late today to to the webinar is because I was at a, I was at a symposium down in St. Mary's County, St. Mary's City, Maryland. But, and, you know, something that's really important about, to me anyway, about telling the history of these roads is not just, you know, the, the construction, but the people behind them, the communities that get together that, you know, re- and that's, you know, what I like about the Chinatown story, right? So, basically... Chinatown, you know, they, the re- residents as well as activists sort of organized together because, you know, Vine Street is going to cut right through their neighborhood. And so basically, <laughs> you want to talk about, you know, 
a coalition of unlikely partners. You had the traditionally minded Chinese Benevolent Association joining forces with the Yellow Seeds, which were a group of young radicals. So basically, the young radicals would gather on top of condemned buildings to shield them from demolition crews. And they would wave signs that read Chinatown for people, not cars. Save Chinatown, homes, not highways. They also chanted Save Our Church, which was a reference to the Holy Redeemer Chinese Catholic Church on Vine Street, which had a significance as being the oldest, the fir- well, the first and oldest Chinese Catholic Church in America. So Philly's, you know, Chinese history basically you had immigration that came east in the 1870s from the west coast and then interestingly the chinese catholic community kind of started up in the 1940s and you know they weren't just about you know providing spiritual services but also educational opportunities for first generation first generation immigrants um but yeah, so their efforts, along with other groups, basically led to a number of the design modifications that went to the design. The big one for that neighborhood was to move the highway around to save Holy Redeemer Catholic Church and School. But basically, their efforts, as well as the efforts of other, you know, activists and com- and communities, are you know, they helped get you know, save Franklin Square and other historic properties. And, you know, helps redesign different, you know, ramps in different areas and of the highway, as well as even the aesthetic stuff. Interestingly, later on, when after the 1977 environmental impact statement called for more mass transit in the Vine Street Corridor, the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation constructed a community of mixed income residences with parking and green space over the center, center city commuter tunnel. So I, you know, I just thought it was really cool to see how this, how they, as how this, how the Chinatown community as well as the other communities, you know, yes, it delayed the highway a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, you know, but a lot of cultural aspects, cultural landscapes, cultural history got saved as a result and we still have you know a a highway that goes across one of the other significant developments was the battle over the territory of franklin square which in this planning map you can see at the center of the picture now there was a big battle over what was to happen with the connecting ramps between the vine street expressway and the ben franklin bridge which you can see off on the right hand side of your picture um, originally, there were going to be high-speed flyover ramps to connect the two, uh, which you can see in this original plan. Uh, the city of Philadelphia and community groups strongly opposed this plan because it would have also condemned land that was dedicated to Franklin Square, and also the elevated structure was would have literally loomed over the green space um, surrounding the square. So... In the end, what they came up with was the compromise of the infamous traffic circle, or traffic circle, traffic signal. Um, So to connect the bridge with the expressway, they built an at-grade intersection instead of building direct high-speed flyovers. Um, We will talk about this probably a little more. We'll revisit it when we get to the New Jersey side of the river, but this is also an example, a rare example, of a traffic circle on a signed interstate highway. I-676 technically passes through this traffic circle to join the Vine Street Expressway on the other side. I might disagree with that a little bit. Well, PennDOT might disagree as well. So there's not necessarily an agreement as far as where I-676 actually goes. Uh, The Federal Highway Administration believes it to follow the alignment through the traffic circle here. However, PennDOT signs it as following the ramps to I-95, which are on the flyover in the middle of this picture here. Um, Which one is correct? Um... Who the hell knows? That's not. I have another decide. interesting point I'd like to throw in there, which is, in the state of New Jersey, there are only two numbers in our entire. Uh, 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 there's more than two numbers. There's, there's like three or four numbers in our entire system that have never been assigned, 
And one of the most notable ones is 176, was never proposed for any highway. And the going thinking on that was, if 676 is the interstate that connects 76 to 95 in Pennsylvania, maybe you're holding that aside thinking FHWA may say the New Jersey one is 176 and it ends at the Ben Franklin Bridge. So they ended up with it being a continuous route, but you never know what they might have gone through, and it, that might have, they might have held it aside thinking that was a possibility. Yeah, so Federal Highway ended up letting 676 slide in this case, but, they, right. but New Jersey might have thought that they weren't going to. There's a distinct, I, I think they were thinking those lines, yeah. I think that makes sense, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So that is the infamous I-676 traffic circle, which I'm sure we'll see a little bit of on Meet Weekend. Um, oh. Let's try to zip through some more of these highways now. Um, Roosevelt Expressway, U.S. Highway 1. By the way, the picture on your right, in case you're not sure what you're looking at, I'm going to tell you that this is one of the more awesome points of an expressway in the entire northeastern United States. What you're looking at is the expressway that is built very deep in a trench. The 14-foot clearance sign is covering up what is actually a below-grade SEPTA subway tunnel. And then on top of the subway tunnel is the actual street grid. So you have three levels of transportation represented here. Um, that's what the central piece is. It's actually a rail tunnel that is somewhat exposed because they, when they built this highway in the early 60s, they had to shove it in somewhere, so they just went underneath the tunnel. <laughs> so that's how they got that piece in. The Roosevelt Expressway, as... As a part of the expressway system in Northeast Philly, connects the Schuylkill with Roosevelt Boulevard, which is the main surface thoroughfare through the Northeast. Um, this road has a really nasty reputation when it comes to safety. There are constantly stories on KYW and all the other Philadelphia affiliates about crashes on the boulevard, and Philadelphia officials have put in speed cameras and red light cameras over the years and that doesn't really seem to have helped much you still get stories about you know nasty rollover crashes and fatalities and pedestrian impacts that's another big thing that happens on the boulevard um so it's one of those things that just hasn't really improved even in spite of the city's efforts to do anything about it um we will talk more about the Northeast Expressway in a little bit, but one of the one of the major unbuilt projects in Northeast Philadelphia was an extension of the Roosevelt Expressway through the Northeast that would have utilized the through traffic lanes of the boulevard. Um, it was dubbed as the Northeast Expressway. It was another one of those expressway projects in Philadelphia that died an unceremonious death in the 1970s. But you can see how the boulevard is laid out um, in these two pictures here. So the inner two roadways are the express quote-unquote roadways, and the outer roadways are the local roadways. Um, so you basically have four roadways of three lanes apiece. Um, and because of how the boulevard is laid out, it's very difficult to make turns from the outer roadways. You're and you can only really switch between roadways at crossovers that are placed at intervals along the boulevard. Uh, and they're not, then the crossovers aren't even really signed all that well. So you kind of have to know when one is coming up. Um, it, it's just a mess. This, this road is terrible. You know, it, Love it. I think this road is worse than the Schuylkill Expressway. I, I actually uh, might be inclined to agree with you on that. Old. I hate the Roosevelt Boulevard. It is, it's my least favorite road anywhere ever. Oh, I detest I'm driving it. So I love the deaths that happen at the various intersections. It's wonderful. <laughs> I, the re, like the reason why I hate it that much or so much is like the lights are so terribly timed. Like it, it is impossible, even at like two in the morning, which I have driven on that road mm -hmm. to hit more than one green light at a time. Like even in the dead of night, you cannot hit more than one green light, and it's I I've it's, dealt with that. So it's awful. I hate that road. It has button copy. Okay, button copy 
still makes me angry. <laughs> yeah, this. but but well, to our loyal viewers, they need to understand where to find the button copies. So well, I'm glad you mentioned button I love copies, button Steve. Copy. Yeah, because on this slide, I've included some of the infamous old school button copy that the Boulevard is still famous for within the road enthusiast community. However, I should tell you that a lot of this historic button copy has disappeared within the last couple of years, and even more of it is set to disappear in coming months and years. Um, so, mm -hmm. and in fact, I was disappointed when I came down to do some scouting for the meet that some of the stuff I was expecting to encounter had even been replaced at that point. Um, so, but do you see, like, some of the, the old oh, classic... It looks horrible. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you see, like, the, the old classic U.S. Highway Shields there. I mean, those are, those date back to, what, the 60s, I think? Um, those are very old school, and they've, some of that stuff is still hanging on in other parts of the metro as well. But um, the Roosevelt Boulevard had the largest concentration, I think, of old school signs until recently when they started replacing a lot of it. I mean, I guess you can give PennDOT some credit for it having signs that lasted 50, 60 years. Well, they didn't last. They just never replaced them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they still look good, though. You know, like that, like the signs that I've, I've got on this slide, I mean, those signs are probably 60 years old, and they look better than signs that are 10 years old. You, know, like you can blame time. the lack of competent traffic engineers for that one. Well, maybe they should give you a call. They should, but then I would have to replace it, so you don't want them to give me a call. <laughs> All right, so that's the boulevard. Ian got his... Uh, Horrible road. His chest. Terrible. Awful Wonderful road. road. Terrible. Well, Terrible. I love all the beautiful button copy. Yep. The button copy signs are the only good thing about that road. Yeah. And, it's, and it doesn't have a toll. I also like that. Steve definitely oh. likes but, that. But the way that you drive, yes, there is a toll. Yeah, well, did we did we sufficiently cover the speed camera thing on the boulevard? Yeah, there's speed and red light cameras. Yeah, and they're and they're freaking everywhere too. What's yeah, the I think it's like seven every intersection. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I'm gonna have to really make clear in the meat notes, you know, for the Saturday drive is. I'm gonna have to put it in like italics and bold and like underlined a bazillion speed. times, like. Oh, by the way, assholes, there are speed cameras on this road, so don't get any stupid ideas. Only I'm, I'm allowed to have stupid ideas. When did those go in? I mean, like, the Philadelphia's like, been putting them in gradually over the last decade or more, but um, they move them around, the they put new ones in, they take ones out. You know, it's that kind of, it's that same nonsense that DC does. You know, with their speed and red light cameras. Yeah, yeah. So I've never gotten a ticket there, and people have not driven appreciably differently all the times I've gone. So and can't I think be that. The, and I think the boulevard is the only road in Philadelphia where the city actually does this. Like, I don't yeah. think they actually put speed cameras on any of their other thoroughfares. I could but be wrong about that. Do you have to like put speed cameras on this road? But like, they, I think but they, they specifically yeah. wrote a law to like get them on this particular road. Right, but they put these cameras on the boulevard specifically in the guise of safety. But as we see the, from the safety numbers, it hasn't really done jack. Yeah, the which other I, which I don't know. You know, we might want to have a conversation about just that subject on a separate webinar, but. Uh, you know, the, terrible, the, the question awful, of whether these terrible. camera devices are actually helpful in curbing uh, traffic injuries and traffic deaths, but um, it, the, the, the numbers in Philly they, aren't very good. They aren't, but I will say, as somebody who used to live in Baltimore City, who, which also ha is very speed camera crazy, that the speed cameras, I mean... In Baltimore's case, because of the high number of homicides, like police does, they don't have time to deal with moving violations. It's like the least of their concerns. Mm -hmm. So, if you look at it from that perspective, that it's you know freeing up law enforcement to actually try and handle and solve tougher crimes. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I, then, have heard, I have heard that I'm, argument I'm, too, yeah. Yeah. That's a good. I never it's, thought it's of it. Weird that, for me to, it's, it's weird that, that it's weird that I'm the one over here that's all like woo activist, and then in the same webinar being like woo police. I hear that you two don't go together very well, generally speaking. Yeah. I want to say I heard a stat with the Philadelphia police. They only hand out like an average of three tickets a month because yeah, they're dealing with everything else going on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in the city. Unless you're the fucking parking people. authority. Reason to come to the road meet. No one will give you a ticket. <laughs> yeah, and I was going to say earlier. They can't speak, wait to hand out parking tickets. I've heard that. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the oh, area, the parking uh, authority is still pretty aggressive. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say with the yeah, road meet, yeah, make it a point to mention, you know, if we're in a convoy, if it's a red light, don't try to keep up. Just stop because there are plenty of red light cameras around. I will say for the record that I'm not in support of speed cameras. I'm just kind of throwing the devil's advocate of like, well, uh, here is the that was, that was a good that was a good point though. I never even thought of it from that perspective. Like that's a very good point. Yeah. Like I, I hate speed cameras as much as the next guy, but like, you know, that is true. It is freeing up resources for police to like pursue actual crimes. Yeah, and that's not yeah, it, it the argument makes sense. Um, and I wish that argument was made more in the public, but you know, you, they only really talk about safety, but it's like, well, you know, you're not going to win an argument that way, you know, if you're just saying it's about safety, but the way that Laura has couched it, it makes a lot more sense. Well, thank um, you. okay. We are Nobody way, cares about safety. yeah. Yeah. Ian, what were you going to say? <clears throat> Oh, nobody cares about safety. <laughs> well, especially you, Ian, Mr. Southern no, California. No, I live life on the edge, man. I, I can tell. I know. I've been in the car with you before. Uh, let, we are way behind schedule here. Let's see if we can zip through some of these uh, northern suburbs highways. I will say one thing about 422. St. Gabriel's just, Curve is something that might pique your interest. Um you may look at this highway on a map and say, wow, look at this zigzagging route that it takes north of Valley Forge. And you are correct. That is a very atypical routing for a highway of this magnitude. Um, the St. Gabriel's Hall stands right in the path of the original uh, planned route for the highway. They couldn't come to an agreement on an alignment in the vicinity of the hall itself, so they simply built around the hall. And, of course, that required a huge curve in the highway uh that you can see quite plainly on the map uh and it's known on traffic reports as saint gabriel's curve so that's where that comes from there was also a short-lived idea to build an extension of the 422 expressway to meet the blue route somewhere near radnor it was known quite creatively as the radnor spur uh, this highway, of course, never saw the light of day, in large part because at the time that it was proposed in the 1970s, the Blue Route itself was in limbo. So there was no sense in building a direct connection to a road that didn't exist at the time. Uh, so that's the story on 422. 202, I know that Steve absolutely loves the 202 Parkway. Um, and he would like to say a word or two about that in a moment. I would like to say that the only existing stretch of limited access highway that exists of US 202 in the state of Pennsylvania is between King of Prussia and Westchester, forming a more outer ring uh, to the west and the northwest of the metro area. Mm. Incorrect. Um, what's that? Incorrect. Why? Well, Doylestown. Uh, on 202? It's, it's a freeway for a couple miles there, yep. Or is, that full part freeway. The, or is that part of the uh, 202 Parkway? No, nope, it, it's been a full freeway for as long as the Doylestown Bypass on 611 has existed. It it counts. All right, whatever. Would you would you like to talk about the 202 Parkway? Yeah, Dan. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm just advocating that it, that it counts as a freeway. That's um, and as for the Parkway part, I will say that it has worked wonders to declutter the what's now the. I guess I guess quasi business two oh two. I'm not sure it's really signed like that, even though that was the original theory 
behind it. But no, the parkway, by mm. just having two roads to go instead of one, that whole area now flows. It, it actually, yeah, not, not Norristown, but nor once you get to the actual parkway north of Norristown, it starts working a lot better for you. Yeah, the entire, top, yeah. The, the entire U.S. 202 in Pennsylvania was planned as an expressway, you know, from the north suburbs of Wilmington, Delaware, on up, again, around that arc, around Westchester and King of Prussia, up through Norristown and up into New Jersey. Um, but the only, uh, but, you know, maybe roughly half of what 202's path is in Pennsylvania ever got to see the light of day as an expressway. That's 202. 309, real quick, Fort Washington Expressway. I know, Steve, you don't like me using the term MoCo, but, you know, you'll you'll, you'll get over it, okay? No, I won't. Yeah, I, I'm mm -hmm. sure you won't. I know. I'll hear about it for the rest of eternity. Um, this okay. is a short highway spur connecting far north Philadelphia with the north suburbs of uh, the region. Um one of the major projects on this highway in the last 25 years was the remaking of the Turnpike Interchange, which on the mainline Turnpike is known as the Fort Washington Interchange. Um, ramps were replaced, new flyovers were added. Um, it moves far better than it did when the interchange was constructed. Originally, the, the old interchange did not provide direct access between Expressway and Turnpike. Uh, the new interchange, however, does, and it moves a heck of a lot better than the original configuration did. There was a short-lived and not necessarily seriously considered idea to extend this expressway southward towards Center City in the 60s and 70s, but again, like most other dotted line freeways in Philadelphia, this one never saw the light of day either, although it must be said that this one, of all the ones that never saw the light of day, was not pursued all that seriously mm. so there's that it didn't make it but i mean there was a, there was certainly one of the planned freeways to get into philly just like all the other canceled ones yeah it just seems like the city had more of their eggs in the basket of say the crosstown expressway or the, the expressways west of center city like out that way also the pulaski expressway um, the city was more interested in pushing those highways, I, I think. Or at least that's the sense that I get. Somebody was saying on one of the Facebook groups, if we were going to talk about Woodhaven Road, PA Route 63. Well, young man, if you're watching this PowerPoint, this is your moment of glory, where we get to talk about your favorite Philadelphia hey, Expressway. Hey. Woodhaven Road, Pennsylvania Route 63. Um, which functionally serves as a north-south expressway connector between the Roosevelt Boulevard and I-95 in far northeast Philadelphia. Um, the expressway was completed between the boulevard and 95. It was uh, improved at its southern end to accommodate the SEPTA Cornwells Heights Park and Ride facility roughly around the year... Well, I, I think it was the late 90s when this happened. Uh, the Cornwells Heights flyovers and stuff like that. Um, I think it was late 90s. Um, and then there's also the question of what would have happened at the north end of Woodhaven Road. And then there were plans to extend that highway northwest into the suburbs and exurbs. And ultimately even as far north as the Lehigh Valley. But none of that ever saw the light of day. Uh, and of course, if you look at this, I have the, the entire path of PA-63 highlighted here in red, but the, um, the Woodhaven Road section is just this small piece right here. That's the limited access section of it, okay? So it's not a very long corridor, but it, it mostly exists within the far northeastern reaches of Philadelphia County. And in this picture in the lower right, you can see how the expressway comes to a sudden terminus at just beyond the Roosevelt Boulevard interchange. And that was intended to continue further to the north and west, at least as far as the Pennsylvania Turnpike, maybe even as far northwest as, say, Lansdale, Quakertown, and even as far as PA Route 33 near Allentown and Easton. 
Ah. Our BFF is back. Um, I need to Photoshop a picture of Laura's head on Mr. Angry. Because Laura's got a lot of notes for unbuilt freeways in Philadelphia. Laura can be Mrs. Angry. Mrs. Angry! <laughs> no, I have so many notes, I could do a whole separate episode on just Philly, urban displacement, highway revolts. I'd actually be up for doing it if you are, Dan. Well, see, All right. I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things that I want to get off get off right away is that there are a lot of expressway proposals that never saw the light of day in Philadelphia. Um, it's not going to be practical for us to cover all of them tonight. We're going to go through some of the more significant ones for you in this episode. Um, and Laura has indeed left the door open for another episode, which I will think about. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, if I can be coerced into I doing one. What, one more time in English. I think we should. Okay. Well, I I will think, uh, I will consider I will. it. I agree. Yeah. So th this is a map. What we're looking at right now is a map that was created by a Reddit user. Um, and he, through his research, came up with the alignments of all of the major proposed expressways in Philadelphia from the 1960s or whatever, and he superimposed them on a current day map. And if we just deal with the Philadelphia side of the metro, because that's what we're dealing with tonight, we'll show this same map again when we talk about New Jersey. But one of the things that jumps out to me is just the sheer number of highways versus the number of highways that actually exist. Um, and there are some really interesting and noticeable gaps in uh, the freeway system. When you look at a map of Philly and then you look at the, this unbuilt map and it's like, oh, well, though that makes a lot of sense. OK, now yeah. I can understand why there's the existing freeways were built where they are. And it makes a lot of sense that there would be a proposed highway in X location. Yeah, that that sounds about right. Um, so Laura, I, I know that, you know, we don't have time to go through everything, but, um, actually before I get to you, I want to show the audience more, uh, planning maps here. So one of the things that you notice, I don't like this map on the left cause it's too cluttered and it's, it's too hard to read. But if you look at the map on the right, maybe that'll give you a little bit more of a sense of what was planned. Um, you have the finished routes in the solid lines, and then you have the dashed lines. And then what Steve Anderson did in this rendering is he superimposed the proposed route numbers on all of these roads. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see where, for instance, hey, look, there's an I-695, and there's a further extension of US-1 through the West Philly suburbs and then out towards uh, Chester County out that way. And then US-30 comes into the mix. And... There's a Pennsylvania Route 90, for instance. So there's a lot of stuff here that we could dissect. Um, that that part I question, but that's between me and him. What part are we talking about? Um, Pennsylvania 90? Yeah, so that that's something that we're going to come to in a few slides. I yeah. exactly what number? What talking about. I, I mean, just, just to say here, there was never a number known, because there is a Pennsylvania Route 90 elsewhere. So we could talk about the freeway separately, but the number is just out there there's no there's no consensus on what that would have been yeah so um, stay rude, not, you know, no matter how you slice it i mean it, it might have been i mean in the end if, if they had built it they might have ultimately done that but yeah it, that that's it it seems like more of a hypothetical thing yeah that's my view um if we blow up the map on the previous slide and we just focus on center city here, so you see where Vine Street is and 676, well, it was actually meant to be one of three east-west highways encircling center city. Um, you would have had a southern route following South Street. That became known as the Crosstown Expressway. You had a route along Vine Street that got built as I-676. And then you had a northern route along Girard Avenue. 
And then further west, you had a north-south route to connect the Girard Avenue and South Street routes, which would have been signed as part of U.S. Route 1, which would have been known as the West Philadelphia Expressway. So so many of these pieces that were drawn up never saw the light of day, and it had a major ripple effect on... um, how we get around Philly Metro and how we <laughs> how we don't get around Philly Metro. Have you ever been on I-76 at rush hour? Um, it's just really interesting to, to talk about all these different uh, hypothetical routes that never saw the light of day. Okay, so here's, I think, what Steve was referring to with Route 90. Was it supposed to be Route 90? Was it supposed to be something else? Where if you, well, if you look at old signage plans, it was supposed to be something else indeed. Uh, the Pulaski was, at least according to these signage plans, intended to be a relocation of Route 73. Uh, yeah, that would make more sense. Yeah, so these, I got these uh, plans off of an old thread on the AA Roads Forum. Um, it's really, yeah, I mean, they were they were this close to building the Pulaski, I believe. As, I mean, they certainly drew up all the signage plans for us, so they were certainly close to building it. I know Laura's got something that she wants to say about this road. I do. This is actually, of all the activism stuff that I've shared, this is my favorite. <laughs> um, basically... Um, to construct the interchange. And by the way, a lot of what I'm reading before I continue on, I just want to throw out there phillyroads.com, Steve Anderson's site is just a gold mine. And so, I mean, some of this, yeah. So kudos to him because a lot of, of where I got my information from is from him. But yeah, basically, PennDOT, uh, you know, to construct the interchange between the Northeast Expressway and the Pulaski. PennDOT acquired 100 properties between 1970 and 1974 um, along Roosevelt Boulevard and Adams Avenue in the area just east of Tacone Creek Park. When the first two houses were demolished in 1975, a local group, United Communities Against the Pulaski Expressway, (laughs) erected a granite monument on the site of the two houses. (laughs) The epitaph read as follows. We, the people of the United Communities Against the Pulaski Expressway, in memory of the two houses that stood here, dedicate this memorial to Governor Milton Sharp for his lack of integrity, PennDOT for destroying a city, and Secretary of Transportation Jacob Kassab for his arrogance. So uh, PennDOT probably replied and basically called them out and was like, using a memorial to mourn the loss, to vilify the governor, blah, blah, blah. It's all inaccurate and a bunch of crap. <laughs> I hope they used the word crap when they said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to read the whole quote. I mean, I could read the whole quote. Yes, you do. Story okay. time. Yes. Is it, huh? Story time. Story time. Yes. So their quote in the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin. Using a memorial to mourn the loss of two homes, to vilify the governor, the secretary of transportation, and PennDOT, and to attract attention to a cause was creative, but not entirely accurate. Neither the governor, nor the secretary, nor PennDOT had made a decision for or against the Pulaski Expressway. (laughs) Which I found very interesting. That is like, oh, none of us have opinions. (laughs) <laughs> However, as government officials, they must explore the need for the freeway as a link in the regional highway network that serves the greatest needs of people. Um, so even though it didn't get built, most of the homeowners moved out and 29 of the, of the house, homes were eventually demolished for nothing. Um, PennDOT actually rented out some of the remaining homes as late as the early 1980s. <laughs> So, uh, but ultimately the Pulaski was canceled on July 1st, 1977, when PennDOT PennDOT halted all funding for proposed highway projects. But while this move killed most expressway proposals in Philadelphia, it did not kill the Pulaski because it was still under environmental review. But, basically, by 1980, the chief of the uh, Philadelphia City Highway Department basically said that it was off the plans and out of the pictures completely, and that the Northeast Expressway is absolutely dead, and that it could not be revived. So that was ultimately Pulaski Expressway's end. Mm. Now we 
should mention that this is the highway that was intended to connect the Betsy Ross Bridge in I-95 with Roosevelt Boulevard. So it, it had a very significant intent behind it. Um, as it was, the interchange at the bridge in 95 was... It was built, but as you see in the picture on the lower right, there were ghost ramps that were half completed and it didn't connect to anything for 25 years. Um, until the early 2000s when PennDOT embarked on a plan to finally provide some connectivity between 95 and the bridge and also between the bridge and Northeast Philly's adjacent neighborhoods. These projects collectively became known as the Aramango and Adams Avenue Connectors. Uh, in a project, another one of these never-ending PennDOT projects. Um, the plan has been to connect Aramango and Adams Avenue directly with the Betsy Ross Bridge. Um, most of the new ramp infrastructure is in place, as you can see in these in this aerial picture here. Um, the Adams Avenue connector is expected to open to traffic in 2022. It was not open at the time of my visit here. Maybe it'll be open in time for the meet. Maybe I, not. I wrote to PennDOT about that, asking about part of the status. And yeah, I got it. We'll get back to you. And they never got back to me. So Yeah, well, thanks, PennDOT. <laughs> <laughs> um, They're never going to get back to you. Yeah, so that that I, I intend to take people by the Adams Avenue project um, on one of the meet days. So uh, you'll get to see what's going on as far as connectivity with the Betsy Ross Bridge is concerned. Um, I think that Laura, when she was talking about the Pulaski Expressway, also made mention of the Northeast Expressway, which, as I mentioned before, was a plan to upgrade the inner lanes of the Roosevelt Boulevard to a full freeway. Uh, and there were various different schemes put forth for this as well. You're looking at two different ones on this map, on this slide right now, where you have, and, and what's interesting to note is that both of which involve a new SEPTA transit subway line. Um, so you have six expressway lanes and then you have some sort of SEPTA subway line in the median. Um, in the map on the left, which is the older one, you have the two subway tracks below ground, whereas in the one on the right, which is the more recent one, um, the expressway is depressed below grade and is also in the ditch along with the subway. Um, ambitious plans, certainly. Um, I would have to say that it would be better to separate the express lanes into a true expressway and not put those lanes in conflict with pedestrian and bicycle and other cross traffic. But um, the Northeast Expressway ideas, as ambitious and as realistic as they might have been, they never saw the light of day. Laura was actually texting me yesterday or was it yesterday or two days ago about the Cobbs Creek Expressway in a neighborhood that was in the path of that highway um, that Laura has really wanted to do some research on and tell us all about so Laura I know you want to tell us about the Cobbs Creek oh, Expressway and I want to tell you guys about the Crosstown Expressway as well so Laura why don't you start mm -hmm. off sure um yeah so Sorry, I have to find my notes. So I actually had the Crosstown pulled up first. But that's okay. Um, my notes. Yeah, so basically the Cobbs Creek Expressway <laughs> was basically going to go from I-95 near the um, Philadelphia International Airport going up um, and basically following along the different sides of the creek, of Cobbs Creek, starting on the east side. Um, cutting through Eastwick and then crossing over to the west side and pass and cutting through Colwyn and Yaden, and then basically was then going to turn east along Baltimore Avenue and then run along the SEPTA alignment to um, Gray's Avenue to 76. What I found really fascinating as I was researching is just north of the Philly Airport. You can kind of see on the map this 
sort of, you know, so where 695 was first supposed to come up, you see this area, the, the, the neighborhood that it was going to, you know, skirt the edge of. It was called Eastwick. And what's really interesting oh. about Eastwick is that it was going to be one of the largest oh. urban re- residential <laughs> urban renewal projects in the country. And so, but that actually, that predates the expressway. But then the expressway was planned. <laughs> and ultimately, neither one got built. Got built. And then, the, and so all these people got displaced from Eastwick for urban renewal. And then, the and then, you know, the highway, which interestingly was supposed to have an exit that was going to come, you know, right into it. And... <laughs> Then, you know, the the Eastwick neighborhood is some of the lowest lying land in the city. <laughs> so the people that later did move in and the ones that remain now have may uh, the city seriously looking at relocating them as the first climate refugees of Philadelphia. So this area, so the Cobbs Creek Expressway goes through an area with a lot of rich and really sad history. Um, but a big part of why the highway didn't get built, um, was, um, because of the environmental concerns of being right on Cobbs Creek. And so one thing that did come out of it is the, the John Hanks National Wildlife Refuge at Tinicum. And that's an area I definitely want to explore and check out. Um, and it, it turns out that this is a case where, yes, building the highway here would have been bad for environmental reasons. And as we're seeing, you know, with the the tragedy of what happened with Eastwick with 19,000 people being displaced for the urban renewal project, which interestingly, Eastwick was a was naturally a racially integrated neighborhood that was then going to be was then going to be marketed as a was on paper, then supposed to be marketed as being racially integrated, but then in practice was not <laughs> when they were redeveloping it. And so it's just something I went, I really went down the rabbit hole with. And is, you know, you look at it on a map, you look at the Eastwick neighborhood on a map, and you're like, what? This, this neighbor looks really weird. Why? <laughs> you look at where Cobbs Creek Expressway would have gone on the map. And it's just, yeah, it's it's amazing how the the story behind the the line, the story behind the blank space on the map. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, yeah. well, you do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, one of the other factors that really killed the Cops Creek Expressway was the cancellation of the Crosstown, which it was supposed to feed into. Um, because the Cobbs Creek was really planned as a western continuation of the Crosstown, which was drawn up originally on plans as the South Street Expressway. So remember, there's those three east-west highways around Center City. There's the one on South Street, there's the one on Vine Street, and then there's the one on Girard Avenue. So if you take the Vine Street and the South Street and then tie those to the Schuylkill in 95, you have a perfect inner rectangular loop around the center city core, and that's what planners were ultimately going for. The South Street Corridor, which became known as the Crosstown Expressway, existed on planning maps until the mid-1970s when community opposition ultimately won the day. There were multiple different schematics you know, they were looking at elevated proposals for expressways. They were looking at a below grade with, you know, um, air rights development on top. They were looking at parks being built on caps above the highway. They looked into a bunch of different options. Ultimately, they couldn't find anything that anyone could agree upon. And then ultimately, the plug was officially pulled when funding for the project was officially pulled as well. Um the cancellation of the Crosstown in 1974 ultimately is what was the final nail in the coffin for the cancellation of the Cobbs Creek Expressway to the west a few years later. I've got to say, though, as much as this could have been useful for some of the north-south traffic through the city, imagine what 95 would be like from the 695 merge south to 476 if there's an extra freeway dumping into it. Oh, 
uh, <laughs> yeah, that way, if you think if you think it's rough in Ridley Park as it is, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. My last, my last comment, <laughs> in all my notes, actually, I'm saving the best for last, right? I suppose with Crosstown Expressway, um, basically the the opposition group that that really you know that 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 came together was called the citizens committee to preserve and develop the crosstown community ccp dcc and it united the mostly white residents in the townhouses of society hill and rittenhouse square just north of the proposed expressway and the mostly black residents along the route of the expressway and you know even the oh and even though a lot of what, you know, the solutions that got proposed to solve for the Crosstown, you know, didn't get put into place, a lot of that stuff did get put into place with the Delaware Expressway with 95. Hmm. Because, because you know, uh, there was some crossover, right, with Society Hill. And um, so it's it, it really, you know, I'm, I'm talking about these different groups in relation to like specific highways, but it all, they all, they don't, they're not in separate silos. You know, the actions of one, you know, ultimately affect, you know, affected different neighborhoods and different roads. And, you know, it's the whole network as a city. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting study, uh, that one could do. Um, Philly is a really diverse and interesting city. It's had a very violent, emotionally violent history with roads and highways. And sports. Well, I mean, that goes without saying. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's, Go really, it, it's really interesting to study all of these neighborhoods and how they individually dealt with these highway proposals and how the city collectively dealt with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to mention the Maniunk Expressway really quick. Now, this picture that we're looking at on the left is the historic Maniunk Canal, which was built as a, you know, one of those uh, bypasses of the rapids on the Schuylkill River in the northwest of Philadelphia County. Now, as we mentioned before, traffic on the Schuylkill Expressway itself was hopelessly bad by the 1960s, within 10 or 15 years of it opening. So one of those schemes that was proposed or put forth in order to do something about congestion was to build what became known as the Maniunk Expressway, which would have been another highway on the opposite bank of the Schuylkill that would have depends on what publication you read. Some indicate that this would have been another bi-directional expressway. Others seem to suggest that the Maniunk would have been built to serve westbound I-76 only, and the existing Schuylkill would have served eastbound I-76. That seems mm -hmm. to be the more logical path here. Um, and one of the things they would have done in the far northwest of Philly in the Maniunk region was to fill in the Maniunk Canal that you see here and convert that into a four-lane roadway. Uh, whereas the existing expressway would have been restriped for four lanes, you know, in, a, in another configuration. This idea, as grand as it was, never stood much of a chance from the onset, um, especially as you get further south towards Center City. You can see the planning map on the right where the dotted line is. You can see how even they didn't really know what the hell was going to happen with this highway or where it was going to terminate. As you get further south and as you pass through Fairmont Park in the area along the river now occupied by Kelly Drive and the boathouses and all that, um, there's they really didn't have a hope in hell of being able to push a parallel highway on the opposite bank of the river through. Um, this was another one of those ideas that was floated as sort of like a last ditch effort to do something to address Schuylkill Expressway congestion, but it never really stood much of a chance realistically. I mean, th this feels like it's something that evolved into the blue route later, since you look at where it ties in on the north, and this doesn't seem viable, but if you swing it west, now you're serving a different corridor, and that, that probably evolved. That'd be my guess. 
Yeah, I mean, if you go off of this map, right, it's tying in at Plymouth Meeting, so... Yeah, I mean, that's where the blue route ultimately ends, so... Yeah, you can look at it that way. Like, they took the four-lane route and they built it. They just built it in a completely different place to serve a different yep. population. Lastly, we have the Schuylkill Parkway, which was planned as a short-distance four-lane uh, feeder route intended to connect US-202 in Norristown with the 422 freeway near Valley Forge. This rather grandiose looking stub roadway was the only piece of the Schuylkill Parkway to ever be built and it was never open because it never tied into anything. Um, it was built and it was orphaned and it remains in a half complete state to this day. Um, you can see that PennDOT does make some use of it though as a proving ground for line striping and God knows what else. Mm. Um, uh, they test drivers there for, for various agency things. That that was happening when I was there. Is that what they do? They, it's, it's open to it. Oh. Well, it's a nice proving ground to fly a drone around, too, in case you didn't already notice. I, I leave that to our, our resident drone expert who is narrating this video. Yeah, I don't know who that is. It's got to be America. Clearly. Yeah. How you doing? <laughs> um, let's see. Well, we I guess we can. I guess I can force my way through the bridges segment because I I don't have much of a voice left, but I'll I'll struggle through it. Um, let's see if we can rapid fire race our way through the bridges of the Schuylkill River, which is the bridges segment we'll focus in on in this episode. Um. I've got a bunch of different bridges I want to feature here. We're not going to cover every single one on the river through the city of Philadelphia. I've picked out this selection because I think that they're the most historically significant of the bridges, and also they're the bridges that we're most likely to come across in our travels during Philadelphia Meet Weekend in August. And then we'll also, as you can see here, we'll have a little subcategory for bridges of Center City that we'll deal with uh, when we get to that part of the river okay so all of these bridges here you can see them listed um most of them the vast majority of them are open to vehicle traffic only i think the i think the only rail bridge we're going to talk about extensively is the arsenal bridge but i really like the arsenal bridge so i'm going to make an exemption for that one um, otherwise the rest of these are open to vehicle traffic only and there are those that bunch of them on the screen so let's start to go through these one at a time here okay Maniunk Viaduct in Northwest Philly built by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1918 it is a beautiful reinforced concrete arch bridge um, it's a bit odd in the fact that it's built on an S curve if you look at it on a map or if you look at it um, just from the right angle there. It's unusual to build a bridge of this design on that type of an alignment. Um, it served the Pennsylvania Railroad well until it was closed to rail traffic in 1986. It was finally reopened as part of a rail trail in 2015. And it will be the focus of one of our meet, uh, pre-meet meet events. In oh, that's angry. Yeah, try saying that with a mouthful of teeth. It is a beautiful bridge, though. I must say. I'm angry I have to wake up early to go see that. Yeah, I know. I'm sure you are. I have to. Yeah, if you haven't done the Maniunk Trail and you're in Philly, this is this is one that you should come check out at some point. I will check it out at some point. Yeah, well, Ian, I'm sure you've done it already, haven't you? I've actually, I've actually never done it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so... I think think it's gonna have to be done. I I think I think you're onto something there, young man. If you're coming to the meet, I'm gonna have to walk it with you. Well, probably yeah. Oh, well, those two are gonna walk down the aisle together. Oh, so cute! How cute! Yeah. Actually, we're actually gonna renew our vows underneath one of those transmission towers. So. I think that's a I think that's a fantastic idea. I think you know. <laughs> yourselves for that. Everyone should come to the pre-meet just to see it. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm gonna cry. That's that's part of uh, that's part of us. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we well, you. I was gonna say it is my anniversary weekend with Mike. Yes, it is. Right. Oh, now I'm actually gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the walk. There might be a vow renewal. You never know. <laughs> Maybe, you know. I'm sure we could arrange that. It's not too. It's not too late. But Dan, you'll have to go get a um, minister through the Universal Life Church. Oh yeah, because you're goofy like that, aren't you? Okay. All no, right. the universe isn't the Universal Life Church the one where you can just like get ordained online in like 15 minutes. I see. I don't know my ordination nonsense, so you'd have to you'd have to help me out with that. Yeah, leave it to your you know activist, urban planning, historical preservation, you know, religious member of the panel. Well, we'll just make Erica do it. Yeah, sure. How hard could it be? Fifteen minutes. Yeah, you know, fifteen <laughs> minutes could save you fifteen percent on ordination. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Falls Bridge. From 1895, there's a really pretty builder's plaque on the east bank of the river. I have it in the picture here. So if you're walking the Kelly Drive Trail, you can see it there. Um, this is a three-span truss. It's got a very interesting shape to it because it was originally designed to be a double-deck bridge. But the, only the lower level currently sees traffic. The upper level was never completed due to funding constraints. I'm not really sure what they would have put on the upper level. Maybe they would have put some sort of elevated trolley system. I'm not sure about that. Um, I don't know that they would have put another roadway up there. Um, but anyway, the upper level was never completed, although the superstructure work to support it was in place as part of the original construction. The twin bridges carry the Roosevelt Expressway over the river. Uh, they were built in 1961. These are your standard um, steel and concrete, early interstate highway era, expressway era designed bridges that there's not a whole lot to say about, but if you are, if you are capable with a drone and you're a little bit creative, you can find some nice angles to get some pictures of them with. Mm. Strawberry Mansion Bridge is really interesting. I like this one. It was built in 1897. This was a bridge that was open originally to vehicles and pedestrians and trolleys. There was a dedicated side of the deck that was dedicated to trolleys, but those were discontinued after World War II. It was closed for about four years in the 1990s to undergo a full structural rehabilitation. Um, it has been fully open to all modes of traffic except trolleys since 1995. And it's in that very scenic area of Fairmont Park, across from the Strawberry Mansion itself. Um, and it's upstream of the real loud and noisy parts of the Schuylkill as you get near Center City. So it's in a very bucolic area of the, of the river. Girard Avenue. This is the third iteration of a bridge on at this location, carrying Girard Avenue over the river. Uh, this current bridge was built in 1972. Um, one of the major thoroughfares of, on North Philadelphia, remember how we talked about the plan to build an expressway along Girard Avenue? Well, it probably would have utilized this bridge, which, if you think about it, that would have been an absolute cluster, because at the west end of this bridge is... An at grade intersection with, I'm forgetting the name of the actual cross street, but the Philadelphia Zoo is right there. And I'm not talking about the Schuylkill Expressway, I'm talking about the Philadelphia Zoo. Um, and the, it would have been very difficult to actually get traffic between the Girard Avenue Bridge and the Schuylkill Expressway in any sort of expressway, in, in any manner that would have resembled an expressway. So. You got 34th Street right there. That's there. That's the one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah that, that's a that's a hopelessly bad intersection as it is. So I can't imagine what it would have looked like if there was an expressway going right through there. I wouldn't say it's hopelessly bad. The time, I mean, it's in bad condition for pavement, but generally, 
unless you're there in rush hour, I couldn't tell you. But the times I've been there has not been that bad to to go through. Or weekends when everyone's gone to the zoo. All right, maybe. I, I haven't run into. I've never run into zoo traffic like you claim. So. <laughs> Okay, Bridges of Center City, and there's there's a bunch of them clustered in right here. Um, so let's do a miniature little set mm -hmm. on these. These are all my pictures from the spring of 2022, and we're going to cover these bridges. Uh, again, we're not going to pick all of them. We're going to pick a selection, and I'm going to go with these ones because this is my PowerPoint and because I said so. Okay, <laughs> so... Yeah. We yeah. talked a lot about the Vine Street Expressway already, but the bridge that carries it across the Schuylkill River was one of the first pieces of it to actually be built. It was built in the late 1950s and was completed in 1959. Um, again, another very bland, uninteresting, you know, early expressway era steel and concrete, uh, basically glorified overpass over the Schuylkill River here. The Kennedy Boulevard Bridge was built, well, this iteration of it was built at practically the same time as the Vine Street Expressway Bridge in the late 1950s. It crosses the river right at more or less the front entrance to 30th Street Station. So when you cross this bridge, you have the main entrance to the station house uh, right in front of you as you cross westbound. Okay, now we're talking about old train stations, right? So I, when I photographed the Market Street Bridge, I did not realize that there's something very historically significant that adorns this bridge that is tied to a historic American train station. The Market Street Bridge, this iteration of it, was built in 1932. It's actually the fifth bridge to occupy this site. When... Philadelphia built their first bridges across the Schuylkill River. The first one they built was actually right here at Market Street. Um, there are four statues, that two on each end, that adorn the approaches to the Market Street Bridge, and they're then they look like eagles. Um, you can see one of them here on the far right of this picture. Now, I thought nothing of these when I photographed them. I thought, oh, those look cool. I'll just get pictures of them. Well, they are actually salvages from the old New York Penn Station that was demolished in 1963. They were rescued from uh, the Wrecking Ball, and they were brought here to Philadelphia and attached to the Market Street Bridge. So that's the story behind the Eagles. I'm still not an Eagles fan, but I hate them a little less now. Yeah, you know, that that was a pleasant surprise. I I never would have thought that they would have ended up here, but they did. I think that's really cool. Yeah, so that, that's... that's and where did you say they come from again? They are from the original Penn Station in New York City. Okay. Uh, the You know, the really ornate, decorative one that was, you know, blown to smithereens to make way for Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Was that why Philadelphia named their team the Eagles? Because New York destroyed them, and they're like, oh, we're worse than New York, so that makes sense. <laughs> oh, <laughs> All right, Chestnut Street. This is, again, another somewhat recent iteration of a river crossing here. This is the iteration from 1957. This current iteration was built in place of a previous bridge that was demolished to make way for construction of the Schuylkill Expressway along the west bank of the Schuylkill River. Uh, so they built the new Chestnut Street Bridge with piers out in the river. The spans are much longer so they can accommodate the span over the expressway itself, whereas I think the old bridge, the piers and the approaches were in the way of the highway. So they had to replace this entire river crossing just to make way for a, the, the four-lane highway, which, as you can kind of tell in these pictures, is on the lower level in this tunnel. Uh, and then the surface street is on the upper level. So they just kind of shoved this highway in right there. And it's quite terrible, but they, you know, they, <laughs> they did what they had to do, I guess. 
Um, Walnut Street, kind of a little brother to the Girard Avenue Bridge in appearance. Um, this iteration of it was completed in 1990. Not a whole lot to say about this one. Um, it's there, it exists. Again, the, the architectural and engineering similarities to the Girard Avenue Bridge should be uh, noted here. South Street is another interesting one. Um, this current bridge was completed in 2010. Its predecessor was completed in 1920 of a very similar appearance, except the original South Street Bridge was a double leaf bascule bridge um, that was notoriously in poor condition by the time the 21st century dawned. So it was replaced with this bridge. Um, the current bridge was fitted out with aesthetic lighting, which lights up in the evenings. However, part of the requirement of having aesthetic lighting on a bridge is that it has to work. Uh, and actually, <laughs> since 2017, the lights on this bridge have not been functioning correctly. And in fact, they've been shut off by the city of Philadelphia. So who knows how much money was actually invested in this aesthetic lighting that doesn't actually work. That was useful. Five times as much they should have spent, and it wasn't enough. Well, you know, that's not the first bridge I have experience with where the aesthetic lighting doesn't work. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why some of you are laughing. I don't know. I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, I bet you would like to know, wouldn't you, Steve? I just, I just serious emoji all around. That's uh, it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I said that we weren't going to talk much about railroad bridges, but I really like the Arsenal Bridge, so we're going to talk about this one for a second. Uh, it was built in 1886. Um, it's named for the old Schuylkill Arsenal, which used to stand on the east bank of the Schuylkill River, uh, right near South Street. That's how it got its name. Um, the electrical lines overhead have been de-energized. The swing span of the bridge has been fixed shut for a number of years. The bridge is still classified as being active, however. Uh, I don't know how much service it actually gets. I, I think it serves as nothing more than a rail spur at this point, but it is still listed as active. Um, and the picture on your left you can kind of see where the Schuylkill Expressway was shoved in underneath this bridge. And this is, again, another example of what we were talking about before with how they've shoved this highway in where they could, and there's just no way to widen it because then you'd have to basically obliterate everything on either side of it just to add another lane in each direction. Um, this is a classic example of that. I did mention that about that about the school goal, but the plans were upstream of this bridge. I doubt they were intending to widen this far down. Yeah, I think that what you were talking about was more in the Maniunk Conchahawken area, but yeah, um, leading into the city, not within the city exactly. Yeah I, yeah, I can't see them doing anything here either. You can unless you demolish the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of bridges that should be demolished. <laughs> The expressway bridge itself, now see, I have been over this bridge countless times in the last 15 years, and I never really knew that it looked like this until this spring. Um, another classic steel concrete expressway era bridge. This one was completed when the expressway was extended down to Passyunk Avenue in 1956. Now, the University Avenue Bridge that stands today on University Avenue, believe it or not, um, looks more or less like the old South Street Bridge that I was telling you about. It was a double-leaf bascule bridge, just like this one is. Um, this one was built in 1930, still containing a lot of its original ornate decoration on deck. The modern-day Grays Ferry Bridge was built in 1976, and it replaced a movable bridge that we will talk about in a second here. Uh, the modern-day bridge is a high-rise bridge that bypasses the need for any movable span at all. 
It's got lanes for traffic, and it's got very spacious walkways for pedestrians and bicyclists as well. Now, remember how we were talking about the Schuylkill Banks Trail at the beginning of this episode? Well, there is currently an extension of this trail in the works that will utilize some of the old bridge that was at the time utilized as a railroad bridge. Um, that bridge is being revived and refurbished and rebuilt to be used as part of a pedestrian trail extension of the Schuylkill Banks Trail. Um, the construction project of progress of this can be seen in the pictures here. You can also see a rendering of what the completed refurbished bridge will look like in the lower left here. Um, because the Schuylkill is no longer navigable up this way, they are simply going to take what I believe is going to be a prefabricated steel truss and plop it on top of the former uh, center turntable pier and call it a day. And it'll be open to pedestrians. The official website says it's going to be open in late 2022. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. So we'll see whenever that opens and um i'm sure it's going to be a really interesting spot to check out whenever it whenever it is completed another nondescript bridge is the past Young avenue drawbridge this one was completed in 1983 uh word to the wise you probably should not bring a drone out here because it's this bridge is located right in the midst of uh, oil refineries, natural gas processing facilities, in other words, it's a high security area and you don't want to, you don't want to mess around with any of that. So I'll just stick to ground level pictures of this bridge. Thank you very much. Uh, the Platte Bridge, which is a bridge that will live in infamy in my mom's family's history because I think that my mom and her two sisters have each had separate incidents on the Penrose Bridge involving blown tires. Oh. Like all the like I'm not I'm not even kidding. Like all three of them. Like when they were in their late teens, early twenties, they all had incidents on this bridge. So like like <laughs> my family still has like like they still swear at this bridge whenever they pass it on the way down to Wilmington from New York State. And it's worth mentioning that when this bridge was built in 1951, it was the main bridge to get you from Wilmington and Chester up into South Philadelphia because the next bridge downstream carrying I-95 didn't exist yet. Um, this bridge was built in 1951. It is named for George Platt, who was a private in the 6th U.S. Cavalry, uh, in the American Civil War, he was a Medal of Honor recipient for actions of bravery at the Battle of Gettysburg. Okay. But most locals call it the Penrose Bridge, and my family calls it the Penrose Bridge while flipping at the bird, you know, on their way to and from Wilmington. I mean, I've seen bad pavement there. I've, I've, seen, I've basically had to drive around potholes. I've never had a problem on it myself, but... You yeah, didn't, you didn't try to. Cause... You didn't try to drive it in the seventies, young man. No, it, but it is like the South End is just very industrial, so it's used as much by trucks going to actual places as it is cars trying to avoid the parallel bridges. Yeah, get it. And lastly, we have the Gerard Point Bridge, which was completed in nineteen seventy-three. It is part of I ninety-five. Um, it is the furthest downstream bridge on the Schuylkill River. The thing that I really want to emphasize here is that the bridge itself was completed in 1973, but it was not fully connected to the I-95 corridor for 12 years after its completion, because at the time of its completion, 95 was still being built around Penn's Landing and Center City to the north, and ground had not even broken yet on the section of 95 around Philly Airport that was not to be completed until 1985. So for the first dozen years or so of this bridge's life, it was really a bridge to nowhere. Um, it connected at the south end to Essington Avenue and to the north end at Broad Street, but it didn't do you any good to get you along the interstate corridor to get you anywhere substantial on either end. So even after this bridge was initially completed in the 70s, 
through traffic still preferred to use the Penrose Bridge because that was the more direct route and it more directly tied you into the Schuylkill Expressway at the north end. Yeah, that's kind of mentioned by Carlos. They built this bridge wrong. They should have had a northbound traffic on the top side so you get a great view of Philly. And a I agree with you. On the bottom. <laughs> that was a missed opportunity, Jeff. I agree with you. Yeah. I am always in favor of the upper level of traffic facing the skyline. You know, depending, regardless of where you are. Like, they got it right with the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. Um, they should have done the same thing here with this one. Okay, at least you have a nice view of uh, Philly International as the planes come into land. Yeah, you know, if you catch it just right, you can race the planes as they're landing Ooh. on the runway there. Yeah, they come in <laughs> right right, basically at the same altitude as the bridge deck. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, be happy to take your questions at this time. You know, if you have anything to, that you'd like us to talk about as far as the expressways of Philadelphia County and the Pennsylvania suburbs, as far as the bridges of the Schuylkill River, as far as unbuilt expressways in Philadelphia, or we can open this up to talk about meat-related things. If you have a meat-related question you would like to ask, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm welcome to uh, hearing you guys, uh, what you guys have to say on that as well. So, um, I'm going to take a voice break for a few minutes, but while I'm doing that, you guys are free to um, put your questions in the live chat or, you know, however else you want to get in touch with me. Um, that That's all That's all well and good. Well, while you're not talking, we can all just trash Philadelphia for a little bit. But no, I, I, honestly, I, even though as well as I know the area, I'm looking forward to some of the bridge views on this meet because... For all you drive the roads in Philly, there are certain views of certain bridges you'll never get from a car. So I'm looking forward to the parts that are on foot here where you get those those new viewpoints. I agree. I'm also looking forward to the angry person who just said he agreed coming back to his hometown with us. <laughs> Hopefully he'll come my house, but we'll say Angry emoji. Could be. I can't wait to see all the new graffiti around town. I can't wait to get a Wawa hoagie. <laughs> <laughs> I miss Wawa so goddamn much. <laughs> there is nothing that compares like out here. Yeah, how many uh, cheesesteak stops are we gonna uh, make here? All of them. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh, so I can vouch if there's anybody in the audience that is gluten-free and or dairy-free, Campos has amazing gluten-free and dairy-free Philly cheesesteaks. And the rest of us will get some extra glutinous, extra cheesy cheesesteaks. <laughs> yeah, of course. As you should. As you should, and as I would if I didn't, you know, if my digestive system didn't hate me. <laughs> But I'm throwing it out there. Anybody wants to go with me at any point during the weekend? Cheese free steaks. I don't know. Cheese with a Z instead of an S. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, mean, like, I like Philly. I, I will go there for the music. I will not go there for any cheese with a Z. That's all right. You do you. Look, I will I will do me. I will eat all of the cheese. But don't do you while you're don't do you while you're on audio here, but safely in your own bedroom, it's fine. <laughs> Steven. <laughs> we can always, uh, we can always go, uh, you know, drink for the evening, then two in the morning, go to Pat's and Gino's and get a cheesesteak then. That's not real cheesesteak, come on. Yeah, but at two in the morning, it's all you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's tourist trap cheesecake. My favorite cheesesteak is in Delta. I think we have the same one, maybe. Are you talking about Leo's? I'm talking about Leo's. I, I love Leo's, don't get me wrong, but I actually found a better place. I uh, you're gonna have to show me. <laughs> I, I will show you. It's a it's called Mike and Emma's. It's on McDay Boulevard. Alright. That's that uh, that's a now a required meat stop. There you go. We, we gotta go. It's such a good place. Alright. 
Oh, and some uh, Philly soft pretzels. Got to get some of those, too. Oh, yeah, pretzel game. Oh, yes. man, now I'm on a quest. I have to find, I have to find gluten-free Philly soft pretzels. Gluten-free. I'm never stopping anywhere that's gluten-free because I'm the biggest glutton of everyone here, so. Steve, Steve has no shame. I'll be welcomed if it's glutton free. <laughs> so tonight we are going through the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania webinar you see here. Um, there is a part two show that we're going to do. You can see it here. I believe the date for that is going to be Saturday, July 9th. So take notes of that. Okay, that's the next show we're going to do. That's when we'll talk about the New Jersey side of things. Unless I can convince Dan to do a part one and a half. Unless Laura can convince me to do a part one and a half. We'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Yay! <laughs> of course, the meet itself is on August 20th and 21st, a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, we hope you can come on out and be a part of it. How are you working that Phillies game that Saturday night, by the way? Uh, you said something about Phillies game. Can you say that again? Yeah, are we, um, are we, uh, buying tickets in advance, or are we just going to show up and, uh, buy tickets to whoever's there? Okay, so what I personally did was there's a block of 20 tickets that I bought. And oh, that's not I'm, enough. And I'm going, well... It was the most that I could secure in a block. So I just know our listeners now, they're, they're, they're all going to want to show up. We're going to need more. Well, there's nothing stopping other people from buying tickets. Yeah, we're going to need at least 21 tickets. Yeah. <laughs> or we could just boot you out, Ian, and we'd be fine at 20. Okay. Fair. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're, they're, I haven't really talked much about this on the thread or anywhere else, but I am planning on distributing those at some point. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see if I hope we don't need more than that. But we'll see what happens. I hope we, we do. I hope we get, get a great turnout, turnout for the game. game. You know? I, I would say that twenty is pretty damn good yeah. for, a, for a game turnout. You know. But uh, yeah, you know, we might. Be, you never know. If the Phillies suck in mid-August, then there will be plenty of other seats that come available. So. You know, maybe it'll all work itself out. I mean, these things always work themselves out anyway, so. I'm not oh, there'll be plenty of seats. Don't worry about that. There's <laughs> also a date game The now eternal for... optimist Jeff. The <laughs> non-road geeks can go to the date game, wait out the road meet, and then meet us for the night game. Yes, Steve. Why don't you do that? <laughs> I might have to, now that you suggest it. Yeah. yeah, you know, call your sister up and be like, yo, we got to talk. <laughs> Um, so anyway, that's meet weekend, August 20th and 21st. Hope that you can join us. Uh, the knuckleheads that are on this call tonight will all be there, including myself. I'll be trying to lead pr the proceedings across the weekend. We'll see how well that goes. Um, and that's it for tonight's PowerPoint. Oh. All right. Yay! All right. Very suddenly we ended. ended. Wow. wow. We did it. Yeah. With our remaining time, I, I want to, I don't know, do you guys want to go until 9 o'clock, or do you want to go to 9.30, or what do you want to do? I'm probably going to hop off here in a little bit. All right. But I am very honored to have been a part of this little shindig today. Yeah, and you I know, I, I wanted to have you as a part of it, Ian, because I know you're, you're Philly bred, so... Yeah. yeah. This wouldn't be a proper presentation without you. Hey, that means a lot. <laughs> you know? Right. Honored to have a part have you as a part of it and looking forward to having you out east in August. Oh yeah. I'm looking forward to being back east. I haven't been back since November. Well, you know, you're due. I am I am very much due. I'm just hoping you're gonna come to my house, that's all. 
And and for those watching the video, it's not what you think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They don't, the, the viewers don't know the inside joke, so. Oh, they they'll have to look that one up. Yeah. Um. So I I want to do something a little different here, and I want to give you guys a before and after. Um. We're gonna look at the drive. Hey, is it? At the old viaduct. We're going to look at the drive on 95 southbound into Center City with two different videos that are filmed about 12 years apart. Um, this first one is the old structure. Um, you know, that infamous old structure around Girard Avenue that we were talking about. Um, this one was filmed in 2010 before the reconstruction really started. And then once we get to this end of the other end of this video, we'll take a look at what it looks like more or less today. But um, this section has changed quite a bit. You know, the, the old viaduct was a bit cramped and it was, you know, as you can see, for the most part, there weren't any shoulders. Um, there were only three travel lanes per direction. Nowadays, I think the new viaduct has four lanes per. Mm-hmm. Um, so the old structure, I kind of miss the old structure a little bit, but I mean, it had to come down. It obviously was on the verge of collapse, so there wasn't anything they could do about it. But um, I did appreciate the original presentation here. Where did this doesn't feel like it was that long ago. I feel like I definitely remember driving this like, like when it was like still around. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is the '95 that I grew up with, so like I still feel like this is still a part of the trip, you know. Um, now there's a big giant orange sign as you approach this intersection. Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned the big orange sign. So yeah, the temporary sign that's not so temporary. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, the, the construction here. This this is something that's best qualified as never ending. Yeah. Um, so that's the 2010 look. Now, if we look at the 2022 look, um, so they're they're still in the final phases of completing the lane configurations and all that, but basically the new structure is complete. Um, and as you can see, the skyline looks a little different now, twelve years later, as we've had some additions. I say there was some new buildings and a new one. Yeah. Um, so here's the new structure. Uh, again, you know, the Girard Avenue exit is still in place, but, you know, the, the, the roadway is a lot wider. The grades are a lot softer. We have shoulders on each side. Well, we will once the left side gets fully reconfigured. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a much more spacious, more pleasant, modern-looking uh, facility. Yeah, which is boring. I, I do miss the look of the old one, just not having to drive it to head south on a weekday or any weekend after 10 a.m. But got to the old one in an off hour. It was an old school drive, and now everything feels brand new, which is good and bad. Yeah, it's bad for nostalgia purposes. Um there's those big orange signs that we were alluding to before. They were put up when the when this contract right at, between Girard Avenue and the Vine Street Expressway was being built. Um, and they were, I guess they were intended to be temporary, but they've kind of become permanent. So those, those, sign, it, those signs have got to be about 10 years old now. Yeah, outside of being a little faded, I mean, they look pretty good. Yeah, it, I don't think it's, it's keep them up bad. after the construction. Just like never just take them down, just keep them. I agree. Orange is my favorite color. It they shouldn't come down. <laughs> it's an attractive color for a big sign like that. Yeah, well, it certainly gets your attention, right? Yeah. Um. Well, in Pentagon, and for ACLs, as much as uh, people hate them, you know, they they did a great job with that. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think that the contracts that have been executed to this point have been done quite well. Um, it's just that it's taken them forever, you know? And I think that PennDOT has come out and actually said in the last few years that once they get to the end of their to-do list um, within Philadelphia County, they are by default going to go back to the beginning and start over again. Because it will have been like 30 or 30 plus years since they started. <laughs> so, like, the I think the first contract within Philadelphia County was the section between Cotman and Academy. And so they may actually go back to that one in like 20 years once they finish the last of the work in South Philly. Like not even, I'm not even kidding. Like they might just go back and redo that one over again. <laughs> and it'll just be a never ending cycle, you know? Which in a way makes sense, but hopefully they're constructed well and they just have to do some spot improvements to it. Well, that, that's, that's the best case scenario, right? But it's been on Philly, so. <laughs> yeah, I ain't getting too optimistic. But we and not. Yeah. Well, that was so. That was the drive through Penn's Landing. What we just went through there. Okay. What about pencil dot? I don't know, Ian. You're a you're a former uh, member of the group, aren't you? That's what they say. It's just a blur to me, though. So. Um, are you the, so? Who is your employer now? Are you you're not with Caltrans, are you? No, I I work for a private company. I act I the work that I do isn't necessarily really road related. I I, uh, I work for a company that designs where they put uh, fiber optic cables under like streets and whatnot. Oh yeah, California. Like I use AutoCAD to like draw out like construction plans for like where they're going to like install uh, fiber optic cables and stuff. Hmm. Um, it's, it's, kind of, Woo. <laughs> it's kind of related because like I have to like draw out like the streets and like the existing underground utilities and whatnot. Um, and then also draw up a traffic control plan for like when they do construction and stuff. But it's not like necessarily road improvement per se. It's just like... It just happens to be the road is where they're putting those lines. But it's a private, it's a private company. It's not a, I don't know what the house. It sounds like, sounds like someone's typing, typing you up right now. I don't know. Oh, no, that's uh, me. No, I thought that was the CHP getting involved. They're like, I disagree with you, Ian. <laughs> I'm going to type this up to your company. Yeah, verbal warnings now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could talk shop about the industry in general for who knows how long, but I routinely am dealing with utilities on construction pro designing construction projects. So if you were in, if you were in my state, I would be dealing with you. Oh, you you would not want to deal with me. <laughs> not with AutoCAD, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like AutoCAD. AutoCAD's easy to use. Uh, MicroStation, man. I hate MicroStation. That's what I use at PennDOT. I hate AutoCAD. Ah. <laughs> enemies. Mortal enemies now. Yeah, there you yeah. go. I mean, we were already kind of mortal enemies with you being from New Jersey and EPA. But, but that's, that's why we're friends. Because we hate each other. Yeah. 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 Our, our hatred for each other brings us closer. Yep. That's why we're going to renew our vows on that bridge over the school. Yep. That's why New Jersey stayed across the river from Pennsylvania because of the love hate relationship. Otherwise, it would have broken off and floated away. Yeah. Would have gone straight to Pangea. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, you, you guys don't know the other story about William Penn, right? That he was offered Camden and he said, no fucking way. <laughs> Because <laughs> he didn't want any part of New Jersey. Yep, yep. Um, I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, you mean he didn't want the the BB and T pavilion? I I don't think he did. No. Ooh. Ooh. 
some good shows there coming up if anyone wants to join me who's listening. Yeah, you, you've got a date there coming up soon, don't you? Um, I'm sure I have a concert there. I wouldn't call it a date just yet, but... Could drag Something, somebody. Something's yeah, dragging me down to Camden, Camden absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on there. Well, it's not PB and T Center anymore either. It's uh, yeah. Freedom Mortgage. No, they just, just, just changed. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, it was another you change it again in another like year or so. Yeah. No, it was another name between February and, and May, and it never even got on the uh, building. <laughs> We're just enjoying a leisurely drive through Center City, Philadelphia on 95 and now 676 while we talk about upcoming concert dates. Uh, Erica, what's your, <laughs> what's your next concert you'll be partaking in? I do not have any concerts planned. Ooh. I, I have a ton of days for concerts. I wouldn't call them dates if I'm the only one going, but... You can date yourself. Not, it's not down your way, sorry. Oh, boy. I'll drag her to something. Meanwhile, I have a concert going on in my living room because every time I'm on mute, I just keep singing Philadelphia Freedom over and over. That is a very good song. Oh, Elton John. That is a very good yes. song, by the way. It is. Because I live and breathe this Philadelphia Freedom. It's really talking about. I was born away the flag. Philadelphia freedom took me knee high to a man. Mm -hmm. Gave me peace of mind, my daddy never had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Philadelphia freedom, shine on me. I love you, shine a light through the eyes of the ones left behind. Do 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 Shine a light, shine a light Shine a light, won't you shine a light Feel that Delphi of freedom I love of you Yes I do Oh yeah You could be along in like carnival or something <laughs> Well thank you I hope it sounded okay. First time I have really sung publicly since I had COVID last month. Uh, there's a reason we all came to listen to you sing last time, Laura. You're go for it. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> huh. Yeah, while we were listening to uh, your thing there, yeah, we went to the Pine Street Expressway and saw those, uh, the uh, verbal. Uh, 611 uh, signs instead of the logos. Yes. Which so, I love doing. Yeah, so there are a couple of things that you should note about those exit signs. One is the alt text, as Jeff was saying. Um, the other is that the Vine Street Expressway does not have exit numbers. Um, there are exit numbers on I-676 in New Jersey, just not on the Vine Street section of I-676. It's a rare outlier of an interstate highway in Pennsylvania that does not have exit numbers. There is no way that is MUTCD compliant. Well, it, <laughs> it isn't, but it's Philadelphia DOT compliant. It's Philadelphia Freedom in a nutshell. Hey, yeah, that's it, you know? Hey, it's, it doesn't need exit numbers. Those are, those are for pussies. And they don't need no stinking exit numbers. And, like, realistically, if even if they did put exit numbers on that, people would still just refer to the exits by, you know, by the street, Ben Franklin Parkway, you know, whatever, you know. The exit, adding exit numbers there doesn't do anything logistically, except it makes the road MUTCD compliant, which I say F the MUTCD, because they have taken from me all of the great <laughs> classic signage on the New Jersey Turnpike and Garden State Parkway that I grew up with and fell in love with. So, oh, F4 False. Guys. False. <laughs> turnpike. There is no way that is Dan Murphy compliant. It is not. And you can, guys can go screw yourselves. Dude, the Turnpike <laughs> Authority made that decision. The FHWA did not 
come to them and say, you must do this or else, because they're not the state agency, therefore the MUTCD, that are the, you know, whoever's going to enforce the FHWA, they only care about state agencies. So don't go blaming my MUTCD for stuff here, man. Yeah, well, I still will. Anyway, so here okay. is the eastbound Schuylkill Expressway. Um... Where do I want to pick this up from? Well, we'll pick it up from right about here, where you can see the very top of the skyline. This is, by the way, right... What the hell was that? I didn't mean to do that. Hello. How are you? I did not mean to do that. Give me one second here. Let me go back here. Minor technical difficulties here, I apologize. Okay, here is the Schuylkill eastbound, beginning at the merge of the Roosevelt Expressway in northeast Philly. Now, you will notice on this drive, on the Schuylkill inbound, um, we are not about to run into any uh, major traffic issues, but that's because this was early on a Saturday morning. And um, one of the things that I have clung to ever since I started filming for the channel 12 years ago is learning when it's appropriate to film in certain areas if the goal is to document free-flowing traffic. And oh, yeah. so filming the Schuylkill on an early Saturday morning is, you know, that's... You know, you guys are at home in bed on an early Saturday morning, but I'm out filming roads on an early Saturday morning because really, realistically, that's the only time of the week when you can get a picture like this. See that, guys? I work the weekends and the holidays. Look so at you. So you don't have to. That's right. I'll be sleeping and enjoying it. Hey. It's up to you how you want to spend your time, you know. <laughs> Recognize that voice, hey. Oh, you just figured that out, huh? Surprise! There are two women on the panel tonight. Yeah, yeah, she's she's here, you know, she exists. I'm just hiding from y'all. She's not dead. It depends how you, which gender you wish to use to identify yourselves. We're not judging you. <laughs> yeah, that's the exit for the Girard Avenue and the Philadelphia Zoo, which is a pretty busy interchange at most hours of the day. <clears throat> Jeff, how are the Phillies doing so far this year? Uh, not a clue. I know they're at 500 the other day. Let's see. I really haven't paid much attention to them recently. So if you were to ask me who's playing, what's going on, I have no idea. What is there up? Uh, but, see, yeah, I mean, they, they spent a lot of money on that team, and they're, they're not getting results, based on what it comes down to. Yeah. This is my favorite part of the Schuylkill right here, and he, as I catch it at the right time, you see some very nice stuff. Oh, look at that. So, okay, so the Mets are in, or I'm sorry, the Phillies are in second place, tied with the Braves with a record of 18-21. and 21. Eight games behind the New York Mets. Mm-hmm. Who, who are playing quite well. Not today, unfortunately. Uh, but the, the Mets usually. are really good. Yeah. They, I don't think the Mets have to worry about the division. Even though, like, three-fifths of their starting rotation is injured. Um, I, I think the Mets are going to win that division. And it's just a matter of how far they can go in the playoffs. Subway series. Well, you know, that's that's what people are saying, but you know, I I always pump the brakes with those people and say, Hey, it's still May. So Yeah. <laughs> you know, God knows what can happen between now and then. Subway series. That would be so much fun. 
Well, we haven't had an all New York World Series in 22 years, so that'd be a nice one. All New York is playing 400 ball. Everyone listening to this, you're invited to come to the Subway Series with us this year. Yeah. We'll have to have a special uh, get-together at one of the games, I think, if that oh, happens. Yeah. We'll, we'll each have to shell out $1,000 a ticket. <laughs> I'll go to the tailgate and skip the game. That might be the smartest thing <laughs> of all. Yeah. Party at Dan's place! Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, my place has actually been renovated and it looks presentable and all that, so, you know, I can actually afford to have people over here. Yeah. You, you did that tonight, apparently. Uh, well, Rachel at Ann's house. At least, at least one brave soul did. <laughs> you know my story, we're not, we're not, you know. No, I, yeah, I, I know. Delinquent. I, I, I'm there. My heart is up there with you. I just couldn't send my my body in time. That's well, all. We, you do know we locked your heart out of the door, so it didn't come in either, right? Uh, I my cat has it. <laughs> That's true. Miss Doe is really the homeowner there. Oh yeah. <laughs> so. Um. Oh, I do want to mention, now that Scott is in the chat, um, today was the Cedar Rapids, Iowa City meet out in beautiful, great state of Iowa. I hope that meet was a success and was a good time for all involved. <clears throat> so congratulations to Scott for putting that one on, put, putting that one together for the folks. And, and, and having, having enough, enough time post-meet to come join us. Boy, he must have no life. <laughs> that, that's an angry emoji right there, I think. I mean... Okay. Okay. So that's that. Uh, what do you say we do... Let's do one more Damn, video. Okay, I'll pump off. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do one more video and then sign off. Oh. I think. Well, I will use this opportunity to say goodbye to y'all. Ian, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for hey, being a part of this. Hey, it's a pleasure being here. See you in August, and we'll hopefully see you on here too. Oh yeah, I'll be I'll be around. I'm still alive. Yay! Always a surprise. Yeah, it's a surprise to me, too. Yeah. All right, well, again, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Yep, we'll uh, catch you hopefully for the next show, and we'll definitely see you in August, bud. All right, sounds good. Looking forward to it. All right, bud, be good. All right, you as well. See you guys. Yep. Bye. Yeah. Well, if you guys had any grievances about Ian, now's your chance to air them. <laughs> oh, that's that's December 23rd. What are you talking about? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I understand that, but, you know, he's no longer on the chat, so. I, I, my grievance is that you're not letting us air them on Festivus. <laughs> well, I didn't say you couldn't do that. I'm, I'm holding on to them till then. That's when I can be at my angriest. So. Okay, well, that's fair. Anyway, hey, so, so while we have this uh, video on here, and for some reason I'm running like 20 seconds behind everyone, so they, they've been improving this road right here for many years, you know, the Walt Whitman Express right here, and that speed limit is still 45 miles an hour. That just absolutely kills me. Yeah. But that's the DRPA. They, they will not do anything about 45 no matter what the uh, road is or, or <laughs> what condition it is. Yeah, I think the, I think DERPA maintains the expressway as far as west as past Young Avenue, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah right where it's the Yeah. And that's where the Schuylkill proper takes off. 
But uh, yeah, from past Yonk Avenue to the bridge, that's that whole expressway section there is DERPA jurisdiction. So just before we went on the curve here, there was a uh, old uh, building off to the right. That's where I've gotten a lot of my Christmas stuff, my Christmas display outside. Oh, really? Is that where, is that where yeah. they come from? Yeah, it's a factory, Kindies, and they make a lot of uh, Christmas stuff distributed around the uh, country and the world. Oh, wow. Well, I figured you had to have gotten it from somewhere. I just didn't, I just assumed you picked it up somewhere locally in Jersey, but okay, cool. It all depends all all around, uh, yeah, yard sales, uh, Kmart. Kmart, of all places, used to have some great outdoor Christmas stuff. Huh. Rest in peace, Kmart. What's that? Oh, I said rest in peace, Kmart. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is there one left store or did it finally uh, uh, close? Can't remember. I don't know. I just know there hasn't been one around here for years. Yeah. I'd... Where was the last one? I, I don't... Wasn't it like out of Florida, I believe. Yeah, I thought there was one hanging on in like Michigan or somewhere out that way. But I don't I don't know. We haven't had one in the New York area in years, so Well, we are going to be wrapping up this show in a few minutes, so if anybody has any last minute uh, questions, comments, anything they want us in the panel to address. Now's a good time to do it. We certainly want to thank all of you who tuned in live for the show. Oh, hi, sweetie. Oh. All right. I hear a three-year-old. Oh, wow. Oh, come on. <laughs> How's it going, Mike? Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. All right. Well, I, I, that makes the show worth it for everyone, I think. Yes, we all got our dose of three-year-old. <laughs> She's not three yet. Sure, her three-year-old birthday meet is coming up. June yeah. 11th, Lynchburg, Virginia. Birthday meet. Oh, is that, what, is that what we're branding it as? Yes. Okay. And, and that's why I've invited you to other stuff, because some of us can't make Lynchburg, but we all want birthday celebrations, so... Oh my goodness! No, 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 don't mute yourself there. She, she's the new announcer. That's it. Yeah, I don't want to listen to Steve. I want to listen to Rainy. I don't want to talk. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Randy, Randy, say Schuylkill sucks. <laughs> Can you say Schuylkill? It might be a little tough for her to spell, but. Can you say short kill? Well, that, that might be a little easier to get out. <laughs> That's the Spring Garden overpass where you can get a great shot of Center City from. Hi, I'm Dewey. Hi, Dewey. Hi, I know. Well, you know, she's she's already smarter than a lot of people in the road in this community. Oh, she's way smarter than anyone on this video right now. I think we all know that. Meow, meow. Well, like a cat. She is my new favorite person. Oh, 
All right, that's, she's on the next panel. That's it. <laughs> I'd rather listen to her anyway. I don't want to listen to Steve. I don't want to listen to me. No, absolutely. I'd much rather hear her dissect the uh, the urban blight of the Eastwick neighborhood than listen to Laura do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry, I'm training her. Well, I, know, I know you are. It's 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 I'm enjoying the hell out of this one. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy I hope I get to see I hope I get to see all you guys soon over there yes I hope so too you gotta come up for the next webinar you know I will we're planning to be up there for the July 9th one alright maybe we can ha you know what I could sit I could host it at my house and get everyone over here we'll do the webinar from here see, see what happens Thank you, sweetie. She just handed me some water, which is also the Philly pronunciation, water. And New Jersey. And New Jersey. Yep. Talkative now than she's ever been. Yeah. It's great. She's got to meet my nephew. She's got to teach him how to talk. That's it. Yes. <laughs> oh, she'll whip him into shape. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. You might like older, older women. women. I don't know. Hey, listen, ding dong. Say something. <laughs> bop him in the head. <laughs> That'll be able to say something. Might not be what you want to say. Oh, done! I'm lucky game! She said, hooray, all done! Did she just go potty? <laughs> Actually, we do need to do that, but uh, I'm going to save your audience from that. Oh, okay. Thank you in advance. <laughs> <laughs> There are those variable speed limit signs, though, right? That we were talking yeah, that's, about. Yeah, that is brand new to me. I've yeah. not been on this road since they put those up. So uh, I think. Yeah, is that a COVID thing or what? 55 right now. I've seen them as low as 25. So oh, wow. They cover, yeah, they cover a wide range of the spectrum. Uh, that's, when, do you know when, when they, they went, went in? in? Uh, I think with, I think it was within the last year or two. Yeah, yeah that, that, that would, would make sense. sense. Okay. About a year, and I can't remember hearing anything about them recently. Hello. There's the Maniunk Bridge right there. By the way, when you're up on the rail trail on the Maniunk Bridge, you get a nice view of the Schuylkill Expressway, the river itself, uh, the Maniunk Canal, which we had the picture of in the PowerPoint earlier. Uh, so there's a lot to see from the deck of the bridge. Um, and, it's all, and the bridge itself is also a, is a historic landmark anyway, so... 
Um, definitely worth checking out. Well, folks, I think we're going to close up shop for the night here. Um, certainly want to thank our panel. We had Ian from Southern California. We had Jeff from New Jersey. We had Alps from New Jersey. We had... Uh, Jeff is from Corporal, New Jersey. Alps is from Taylor Ham, New Jersey. Oh, yes, because you were showing me that breakdown yesterday. That's yeah. right. Yes, we, let's make sure that we get that clear. Uh, yeah, we're in North Jersey's wrong, and South Jersey's right. Yep. No, there's, there's no, no such, such thing, thing as that, that ever, so. so. Yeah. Everyone knows that South Jersey begins at the Cape May Canal, okay? Yep, yep. <laughs> um, want to thank oh yeah Laura was also here and her little ding dong daughter joined us yay, yay. yay. Uh, oh. and uh, Erica hi, was, wait, yeah <laughs> and uh, Erica has been silently watching and discontent or whatever I'm judging you all yeah. that's right yeah um, so that was our panel tonight. So thank you all folks for watching. Uh, it was great to do this show again. The next show in the sequence will be the part two presentation, which will be devoted to the New Jersey side of Philadelphia Metro. And we will be doing that on July 9th. There is already a link to that show up on the channel homepage and we hope to see you then. And we also hope to see you for the meet on August 20th and 21st. And until then, we're signing off for now. And from all of us here, I'd like to say thank you all for watching. And we'll catch you all next time. Bye. Yeah.